Aloha, welcome to Medical Cannabis Day 2022. Medical Cannabis Day is the day we come together to celebrate patients and our rights to choose cannabis as medicine. Whether you choose to use cannabis instead of opioids to relieve pain or treat symptoms of other cannabis treatable diseases, we salute you. We honor you for making the smart choices about your medicine. Our theme this year is cannabis and whole plant medicines for life. Like the dozens of other events that we've held in our local communities over the past decade, you'll find knowledge you can trust from medical professionals and expert cultivators. This event is being broadcast in watch parties around Hawaii with physical in-person events on Kauai at the Anaholo Marketplace. Thanks for Dale Rosenfeld and Joy Kowal Kauai. On Oahu at Karawai Lua, thanks to Jason Hanley. And on Maui at South Maui Gardens, thanks to Bo, Heather, and James. Special thanks to our presenters today who have submitted presentations in advance of the event and are online today to answer your questions. Thank you for the questions submitted through hawaiipatientsunion.com and hawaiicannabisorganization.org. If you come up with questions today, please use the chat window found in your toolbar to share your mahalo for presenters and questions you may have. Your pre-event questions, ideas, and comments have directed today's lineup and presentation topics. The Hawaii Patients Union was formed five years ago at the request of elected officials and community members to help inform patients of your rights and help patients protect those rights. To kick off the event, I have a pleasure of introducing Dr. Clifton Otto, the founder of Medical Cannabis Day. Mahalo, Dr. Otto, for being here. Well, thank you, Maggie, and uh, and it's really a pleasure to uh, to be able to speak to you on Medical Cannabis Day uh, 2022. It's it's been a very interesting past couple of years, and I'm really glad to see that uh, enthusiasm and excitement is building for this. So happy uh, Medical Cannabis Day, everybody. Um, I first of all want to say thank you to all of the organizers. Uh, that put their tireless effort into making this possible. Um, it, it, you know, I've, I've been kind of behind the scenes this year, and, uh, but I, I can see all the hard work that goes into this all the time and, and effort. It's really, really a labor of love. And I uh, especially want to thank Brent and Maggie for, for all the effort they put into to making this possible. Without them, we wouldn't be able to really enjoy this together. Uh, and I also thought it was interesting this year that we have sponsorship from a dispensary. I think that really shows uh, a sensitivity to the needs of our patients. Uh, just a few quick uh, disclosures. I'm a cannabinoid medicine specialist. I'm also a certifying physician for Hawaii's medical cannabis program. I'm not a member or a consultant for any dispensary, and I don't receive any compensation from Medical Cannabis Day. So I've gone over my background a little bit in, pre in previous presentations and how I got into, into the medical use of cannabis. So those are available elsewhere, but I just wanted to start with a discussion of the origins of Medical Cannabis Day so that the, the group can, uh, can be on the same page with their understanding of where this all started. It was really back in the very beginning of, of 2019 uh, when I was trying to come up with a way to raise awareness about the significance of the state authorized medical use of cannabis in Hawaii. Um, as you probably know, I was on the 2014 uh, Hawaii Dispensary Task Force, uh, where we tried to raise uh, this issue of the, the conflict with federal law, and, and, and that, was, uh, that was blocked. Uh, and so I had been spending years trying to work with our state lawmakers to educate and also get them to start a dialogue with me on how this conflict with the federal regulation of marijuana was hurting our patients. And so 2019, I thought, okay, I need to, I need to, to try a new tactic. And um, so this is a little background of our Medical Use of Cannabis Act. Uh, it, it actually took two sessions. It took a biennium to pass our Medical Cannabis uh, Act, it was no simple feat. Um, a lot of negotiating and, uh, and two sessions to finally get a bill to Governor Cayetano's desk, which he signed. Uh, and uh, the program actually uh, was, the, the law was signed on June 14th. 
2000 went into effect December 28th. And it was codified in our Uniform Controlled Substances Act, which is where controlled substances, where the, the statute of controlled substances lies. It's, it's not uniform by any means, actually. The Hawaii changed it when it adopted it in, um, in uh, 1971. It did not follow the guidelines of the Uniform Controlled uh, Substances Commission. Um, and we changed the criteria that, that designates scheduled uh, controlled substances. And it exists within chapter 329. So that's where this 329 card comes from. Um, and uh, part nine, medical use of cannabis. And uh, if you look that up, you'll see that title at the top of that section, medical use of cannabis. It's not botanical use of cannabis. It's not medicinal use of cannabis. It's medical use of cannabis, which is significant terminology. And so I was looking at other days that already exist around this subject. And of course there's 420, which started out as a, as a time, a specific time of day. Uh, it evolved into a day. And, and I think it also started to merge with the kind of national legalization effort. And so I thought that if, if this culture uh, had a day that, that, that it used to, to further its, its uh, interests, why couldn't patients have a day? And um, so I then went back to what I knew about the origination of our Medical Use of Cannabis Act. And it seemed to me that June 14th would be a very appropriate day. This is the day that that bill was signed into law. So meaning that that was the day that the state of, of Hawaii authorized its authority, its constitutional authority to decide that cannabis has uh, medical use in the state of Hawaii. Year was was very small. Uh, I have some T-shirts printed out, distributed for free, just to kind of start raising awareness about this as a, as a possible event. Uh, submitted a proclamation request to Governor Ige uh, in May of 2019. Uh, that year, actually, it was denied, but um, took us three years of trying, and finally, we we got a statewide medical cannabis day proclamation last year. And um, for, for the most part, Medical Cannabis Day has been a, a virtual event uh, and an educational event. Uh, this is a, a poster from last year, a Mahalo poster that shows you all the different participants, the extent of the participation, the speakers. The, uh, we had some amazing speakers last year, but it's been mainly virtual. And this year, um, there are some changes going on and, and it's a time for me to pass the baton. Um, I have not been directly involved in any of the organizing. I felt the need to step back. to the needs of the patients. And, and thirdly, um, there is this need, I feel, to avoid any direct involvement with access uh, to cannabis because of the federal situation. And that's another reason why we need to do something about this federal conflict. Um, there are a lot of other things going on as well. You've probably heard about the dual use, dual use task force that's currently underway. They've had two meetings already. And of course, the elephant in the room is mistakes that all the other states have made by creating state programs uh, that, um, that require a violation of federal law to participate. Uh, there are national organizations that are uh, exerting incredible influence on the task force uh, without any apparent regard for the negative consequences that it's having upon our patients. 
There's also the, um, the attitude of law enforcement that um, also needs to be addressed. You know, our, our, our state and federal law enforcement officials work very closely together. And I think there's something called conf um, um, confluent jurisdiction, meaning state and federal agencies will work together uh, and often uh, assume a federal role. That might be some of the reason why our, our Office of the Attorney General is having difficulty helping us figure out a solution to this, this federal conflict. Um, I'd like to use uh, uh, arithmetic uh, very quickly. This is something that that Dale uh, enlightened me to, to make a very simple point. Uh, and this is just the use of the greater sign, a mathematical symbol to denote inequality between variables, two variables or quantities. And so I just wanna present this, uh, this equation. 614 is greater than 420. I think from a mathematical point of view that can't really be, be argued with, but I hope also from a cultural point of view that, that we can show that Medical Cannabis Day, that the needs of our patients is greater than 420, this kind of stoner, which I think can sometimes undermine uh, the value of our, our medical program. Hawaii is a very special place because of our geographic location, because of our uh, different populations that, that are existing together. And um, we have exquisite control over our, our state boundaries more than any other state. And this can have advantages to developing a, a intrastate uh, market and intrastate uh, medical products uh, that can be exempt from um, federal uh, FDA regulations and the expense of uh, FDA clinical trials. Um, my perspective is, you know, let's just medicalize it from what I've seen uh, from my uh, experience of my patients, from my knowledge of, of the scientific background of the endocannabinoid system and, and how broad and extensive it is in regulating human health. This is really a medicine. This is nothing like alcohol or tobacco. And uh, I think we need to recognize it and protect it as such. Um, I see cannabis as a potential cornerstone for a sustainable healthcare system in Hawaii, at least the way to reduce patients' needs on pharmaceutical medications, opioids, and, and improve the overall quality of their life. Uh, my understanding is one of the focuses of this year's uh, event is grow your own. And I think that's a very appropriate focus given that Hawaii's medical cannabis program started with allowing patients to grow their own cannabis uh, as far as I can tell, cannabis needs to be grown outdoors in sunlight. Patients need to have access to cannabis that has been grown under or conditions that are organic as possible. You know, why can't we have, if we can't have a USDA organic certification for cannabis, why can't we have a state certification so that growers could adhere to certain standards and, and avoid a lot of these unnecessary pesticide tests? Um, we also have HCR 132, which is pending uh, with the Department of Health. This is from the 2021 regular session. Later unanimously um, said that it, it would like something done about this conflict. And, um, and so I think that's a very significant event that both chambers of our legislature would act unanimously to request that something be done about this. And there's a lot of politics behind this. Uh, there's a lot that we need to work through to understand that there are actions that the state can take to end this conflict. Um, but in the end, I, I think it's really going to fall to the patients. And, and that's why I'm so encouraged by today's event. Uh, we saw this at the end of the last session where changes uh, in a bill that was very favorable to dispensaries protected the right of patients to grow uh, collectively for another year. Um, your voice matters. And next year is going to be extremely significant. There is going to be a push for recreation legalization. We're going to have a new governor. Uh, this is the time that patients really need to speak up and we need to make sure that the needs of the patients are preserved. So um, today is also flag day. 
And as in the past, I have submitted flag requests to different congressional delegates. Um, and I did the same this year. And so I'd like to, to read that to you. Uh, the, the temperature in uh, DC was about 83 degrees. It was a partly cloudy day. So I feel pretty confident that, that a flag was flown over the state's capital. And uh, this is uh, the text um, that was approved by Representative uh, Kahele staff. So this is to certify that the accompanying flag was flown over the United States Capitol on June 14th, 2022. This flag was flown at the request of the Honorable Kaili'i Kahele, Member of Congress on the 22nd anniversary of Hawaii's Medical Use of Cannabis Act and presented to the people of Hawaii in honor of our 34,000 plus medical cannabis patients who must violate federal drug law to participate in the state authorized medical use of cannabis in the beautiful Aloha state. So um, today is also a very special day because it is full moon. And so um, I hope that provides some additional illumination to today's event. Uh, please. Spirit of Medical Cannabis Day. This day is for you. Aloha, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Otto. Thank you for founding Medical Cannabis Day and for explaining that for us. Um, up next, we have a special presentation from cannabis nurse Wendy Gibson Viviani, who will be sharing some whole plant medicine facts to help anyone better understand medical cannabis. Wendy has been a leader in education space and has appeared on panels and has selflessly given her time to help patients more times than anyone could ever know. She's a Wikipedia of cannabis knowledge and we're blessed to have her here with us today. There's something in her presentation for everyone to learn. Happy Medical Cannabis Day, everyone. This is Cannabis Nurse Wendy with your 10 minute dose of cannabis facts. Today's topic, whole plant medicines. I'm a cannabis nurse educator and I have no conflicts of interest to report. I have, I make no money off of anything related to cannabis. Whole plant medicines come from the plant named cannabis sativa. There is no plant named marijuana. There are three types, cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and cannabis ruderalis. And these classes are based on their shapes and their physical traits and not on their chemical composition or the effects. The sativas are taller up to 20 feet and they have thinner leaves. These are valued for their medicines, both the drug type and the industrial hemp type. The indicas are shorter shrubs with fatter leaves and they're also valued for their medicines. The ruderalis is a short ditchweed kind of plant and they're valued because they combine with other plants to produce flowers sooner, so they allow more crops each year. Whole plant medicines come from, from three main types of phytochemicals in the plant. And there's a theory that they work best together, that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. These are produced in the buds and in the frosty resin glands called trichomes. The cannabinoids number about 147, and you're probably familiar with at least two of those, the THC and the CBD, and they work together. CBD can buffer the psychoactive effects of THC, so reduce anxiety and paranoia. It can also block THC from changing into a more potent form in the liver after you eat edibles. There are studies showing that cannabis extracts have fewer side effects, psychoactive side effects, than the synthetic THC that's 100%. That's the prescription one. Now, by combining them, both THC and CBD, you can use lower doses of each. And that's desirable to avoid side effects and drug-drug interactions. Both THC and CBD can mimic your body's natural cannabinoids and enhance their function. For example, CBD keeps your body's THC or anandamide from breaking down fast, so it keeps it in your body longer. 
Now the terpenes, there's over 200 of those, and flavonoids, about 20 of those. Those are found in all fruits, flowers, herbs, and trees. These are the essential oils of the plant that give them their distinct flavors, aromas, and colors. There are thousands of aromas. Some cannabis smells like a pine forest. Some is skunky. Some is lemony. And many of these have possible therapeutic value and also might be responsible for some of the side effects. Some of them can help CBD and THC cross the blood-brain barrier or cross skin. And some of them can help out if you ingested too much THC. So a little bit of black pepper or citrus might help bring you down. Now, there are studies showing that just sniffing lavender oil can help reduce anxiety. And there's a terpene in cannabis called linalool. And that's also in lavender. So my tip for today is get to know your phytochemicals. It's really a better way to predict what effects you're going to get or potential side effects you might have. It's better than knowing what strain you've got or whether it's a sativa or indica dominant type. Now, oncologists are integrating whole plant cannabis into cancer care to treat multiple symptoms at once. Dr. Donald Abrams is one of those. He's an integrative oncologist and cannabis researcher. He says that cannabis is the only anti-nausea medication that's also an appetite stimulant. And he routinely suggests that his chemotherapy patients use cannabis to reduce anxiety and says, if I have one medicine that can decrease nausea and vomiting, enhance appetite, decrease pain, and improve sleep and mood, I consider that to be a valuable intervention. And instead of writing prescriptions for five or six pharmaceuticals that all could interact with each other or the chemotherapy I prescribe, I can recommend one very safe botanical. A Canadian survey showed that patients were using cannabis as a prescription, as a substitute for prescription drugs. And it's especially interesting to see that it's for some of the most commonly overdosed on drugs such as opioids, benzodiazepines, and alcohol. So huge reductions, opioids by 30%, benzos by 16%, and alcohol consumption 25%. There's also some evidence showing that patients who are on medication-assisted therapies for opioid dependence might have better adherence to their naltrexone therapy and that it might lead to a slower buildup of opioid tolerance. So potentially using lower doses for longer times and avoiding dose escalation up to overdose. Now, whole plant medicines are not new. They were legal in every state in the United States from 1850 to 1937. And these were mostly powdered extracts, oils, tinctures, and cigarettes. It was available in all drugstores. It was the most popular medicine for 87 years. And it was in the United States Pharmacopoeia, which is the pharmacist's guide. And the uses listed in that included opiate and alcohol abuse, neuralgia or nerve pain, and seizures. So some of the things that we are just now rediscovering its usefulness for. The first legal medical marijuana program in the United States was, and still is, a federal program. They allowed whole plant medicines. So since 1978, the National Institutes on Drug Abuse has overseen this program. They oversee the growing and the mailing of 300 rolled marijuana cigarettes each month to 15 patients. And they took the idea of whole plant medicine a little too far, though they included stems and seeds. But this was a compassionate use program, which is the basis for all the state programs that now allow patients to use whole plant medicines. In 1988, a DEA judge was asked his opinion, and he said, marijuana in its natural form is one of the safest therapeutically active substances known to man, and that if it can be used with safety under medical supervision, then it's unreasonable to keep it in the Schedule One drug category, and that the DEA should not stand between the suffering patients 
and the benefits of this substance. It has also received acceptance of use on many levels, just not federal. Federal still says that it lacks any accepted medicinal use in treatment and therefore is illegal. However, globally, 57 countries in the world do not agree. They've accepted medicinal use of whole plant medicines, and now more researchers are using cannabis-based medicines. In the United States, 37 states and Washington, D.C., and four U.S. territories have accepted medicinal use of whole plant medicines. And in Hawaii, we have over 34,000 patients with access to whole plant medicines. It also received recognition of accepted medicinal use by a United Nations World Health Organization Expert Committee and the National Council on the State Boards of Nursing. And these are the people who control nursing licenses and the state board exams for nursing, um, the NCLEX exams. So I hope that answers any questions you have about what are whole plant medicines. And if you have questions later, please email them to me at cannabisnursewendygv at gmail.com. Thank you. Mahalo for those whole plant medicine facts, Cannabis Nurse Wendy Gibson. Who do we have up next, Maggie? Uh, next, we have our Oahu uh, location host, Jason Hanley at Kerawailua. Uh, thank you, Jason, for hosting our Oahu location. This farm is a model of what is possible when patients, doctors, and growers come together to support our communities. Uh, Kerawailua Farm supports more patients than any other grow operation in Hawaii, and uh, Kerawailua is making safe, accessible, and affordable medicine possible for many patients on Oahu uh, that cannot grow for their own for whatever reason, whether they leave, uh, live in federal housing, centering income apartments. We're good. We're good. Aloha, everybody, and welcome yeah, to welcome Medical to Cannabis, Cannabis Day. Day. No, we're good. We're good. Aloha, everybody. And welcome to Medical Cannabis Day from the beautiful uh, Okalia area right outside of Wailua. And this is where our cannabis collective is. My name is Jason Hanley, and I own Kara Wailua Farm. Working on a little reverb here. How's that? Good to go? All right. Uh, we're going to go back in time a little bit. Cannabis Day was established 22 years ago by Governor Cayetano. All this, although this was a remarkable bill to have passed for its time and allow patients to grow their own 10 plants. Is anybody zoomed in right now? Many people who could grow their own flower were still at a loss, having to mostly go to the black market or do nothing. Although the state recognized this bill, Many people in law enforcement did not recognize this bill and continued to harass and prosecute people who were using cannabis under this medical bill. In an attempt to rectify the situation, the cannabis bill compliance was partially taken away from the Department of Narcotics and placed in the Department of Health. But with no staffing, compliance continued with the Department of Narcotics illegally with agents entering people's property without search warrants and threatening them with arrest and in many cases, seizing plants and product without any official report or any compliance initiated. Such as if you have more than 10 plants then theoretically you should lose your license, not the Department of Narcotics taking your plants without authority. I personally witnessed this at my farm in 2016 as Department of Narcotics agents rolling in under a narcotics investigation said they were going to rip my plants if they were not tagged. And this type of authority caused many medical patients to quit growing and growing their plants, being scared of persecution. This was not the intent of the medical cannabis bill, supposedly used to protect medical cannabis patient users. And this type of behavior lasted about 16 years and still exists today. In 2016, due to complaints from patients, the dispensary program was initiated by the state. Licenses, Dispensary licenses were given to the people who had a million dollars in the bank, making it unfair for most people to even apply for a dispensary license. The reasoning behind dispensaries from the state was to get people safe medicine, but without doing any consulting with other states and how they could get people affordable medicine. 
So to this day, dispensaries are open, but overcharge medical patients, resulting in less than 10% of the 34,329 cardholders visiting dispensary. The largest failure of the state was that they had a task force working with the board to build these dispensaries and build in policy and law to charge medical cannabis patients fairly, and the task force recommendations were ignored. Dispensaries opened their doors with no control on how much to charge patients. Due to the high demand of patients needing medicine or cannabis, collectives started to establish themselves, such as ours. Providing a place for patients to, to add their gross site onto their 3 tonight card, grow their own cannabis, resulting in a cost of less than 75% of what dispensaries charge. Medical Day is being hosted at one of these collectives. A success model providing patients compassionate medicine, a place to educate themselves, grow their own cannabis, and develop great relationships. So where are we now with medical cannabis laws? Fortunately, and the good news, the state has now recognized collectives and is trying to find a way to regulate them. These collectives have become recognized due to their high influx of politicians visiting these sites and understanding the true meaning of medical cannabis and the mass need for patients to access medicine to deal with pain, cancer, and many other illnesses and diseases resulting in most patients leaving pharmaceuticals such as Oxycontin for pain management. Hawaii is in a great place right now to positively turn around a cannabis program and be the leading model of the world. Many politicians ask me about legalization of cannabis. And although I agree with legalization of cannabis, there must be a structure in place to keep big business from taking over the cannabis industry resulting in the loss of thousands of jobs for the people of Hawaii. And I must plug the state of Maine right now as they have the most successful program in the world with a medical cannabis policy in place and adding a 21 year old and over recreational bill, they have solved many of their problems. Maine, like Hawaii, has a population of 1.5 million people. 1.5 million people. Maine, Maine now has over 300 collectives registered with the state and paying taxes while also providing affordable medicine to patients. The state of Maine has embraced cannabis and has left its reefer madness roots. And now communities and cities are growing and healing with cannabis while providing taxation of almost $700 million in the last five years. So for those of you who are watching this Medical Cannabis Day presentation, please find it in your heart if you don't already understand what cannabis is doing for people. And that it is not a drug of the devil. It is bettering lives and families and not contributing to the illicit drug market. This plant really helps and we need all of your help out there to help educate people and move forward. Thank you, mahalo. Love it, Maggie. This is Brent from South Valley Gardens. Uh, thanks, Jason. Is uh, Daniel ready to go? Okay, so go ahead, take your time. So you're just here, that's why I was, and the technical. Uh, yeah, just, just might just go here. Like, yeah, jump in on mine, jump in on mine. All right, All right hold on, it's guys, here's time. Daniel Anthony. Oh man, I had something so nice prepared. It's totally fine. Okay, here's Daniel Anthony. Throw the niceness out. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Oh. Hey guys, aloha kako. Daniel Anthony here. Uh, greetings to all those medical cannabis patients, cannabis patients throughout the islands and throughout the United States. Um, this is really, you know, I want to focus on the farmers and the agriculture in our community and what medical cannabis represents. First and foremostly, uh, let's just go back and, and have a little bit of history that our aunties and uncles and possibly our grandparents are multiple generation agriculturalists who have been using cannabis as a medicine for countless decades and, and generations, as I said. And I think this is important to remember because uh, the current structure of the industry of medical cannabis forgets its actual roots in the community. I think it's very important to remember that, you know, Maui Waui and, and all of these strains that, that had become acclimated to Hawaii were because this was a place that had received them well and had the right growing conditions. Medical cannabis in Hawaii and Aloha are two components that were the main ingredients that essentially they tried to shut down. I think people 
uh, forget about the outlaw days here where it was illegal to do this, just like many of our traditional practices were illegal. So the reason I mention this is because I feel that the industry, and when I say the industry, I speak directly to the dispensaries and their participation and how they support the culture of Hawaii and our community. We cannot forget that we were in this together. The medical cannabis community understands what it's like to live in the gray area and to be outlaws. And I, I, I wanna encourage that community to also recognize where we have alliances. Uh, so for all of you out there in the Hawaiian homestead, uh, the model of a collective is right before you. Think clearly, think wisely and create this opportunity within your neighborhoods. There's homesteads on every single island and these are exclusive zones for native Hawaiians to participate in agriculture that is a solution, right? Producing medicine for kupunas, I think is extremely important and cannot be forgotten. Um, in that, I wanna point out that our industry uh, as a whole is still reliant on imported nutrients. And I wanna encourage everyone to really begin to look at how to support our local economy in producing these. Look, if you are making soil out there in the community, if you have manure, these are the things that the medical cannabis community should and I would like them to see grow in this arena. Why? Because these are alternative industries that are positively impacted by people growing good medicine. This keeps our economy strong. It grows our jobs and it helps people value waste. When we can take waste and transform it into nutrients and then take that and turn that into medicine, that is the core of sustainability. And I wanna just encourage everybody that's participating in this to start to operate as if the boats have already stopped. I think this is very important for us to keep in mind. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. And the more that the medical cannabis community is insulated and sustainable, I believe that's a future that we can pass on to our children. And I want to just encourage the multi-generational aspect and help people to also understand that our kids are as much impacted by the legislation and policies that we all fight for. When their aunties and uncles who are farmers are not looked at as criminals, you know what happens when you go to school and you know what your family does and how does that make you feel? This is a situation where we should be proud of our agricultural roots and what people are doing in the community. And I wanna just help to encourage everyone to see this solution for what it is. I mean, this is the reality. Cannabis, medical cannabis is the most scrutinized medicine. Look, there's less scrutiny on pharmaceuticals that you can go and get yeah. than there is for cannabis. And this is important to remember that this is such a powerful tool to help our community heal that it has actually surpassed all that scrutiny, has survived for 22 years, still sealed. I'll leave you folks with this. This is the first year that I am celebrating Medical Cannabis Day and it's a 22 year old celebration. So I just wanna encourage everyone to look at their friends, their neighbors, their, co their cousins and recognize that this is a political movement that is still yet in the infancy, yeah, it's a very powerful movement. Those 34,000 patients are the largest unorganized group of farmers in Hawaii. We have lots of power, let's exercise it. I'll see you guys at the Capitol, third Wednesday in January. Aloha no, ahui ho. Woo! Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, thank you for that, that was amazing and sums up everything that we're really trying to get out across to the patients right now. Um, uh, it's going well. Um, up next, we have uh, Dale Rosenfeld. Uh, Dale is coming to us from Kauai. Dale is a conference organizer. Um, her company is Joyful Kauai. She's coming to us from the Anahola Marketplace today. Dale's a patient advocate um, in addition to being an event organizer and we're super grateful for her uh, efforts to organize on Kauai and bring more people into the fold. Aloha Dale, please take it away. Aloha. I'm Dale Rosenfeld. 
and I'm out of the dark. Please join me at the end of this presentation for a conscious cannabis conversation. I love to bake brownies, cookies, popcorn with infused butter. One of the things that I've learned is ingredients and proportions count. When I make these brownies, I scoop from all of my jars, very happy pans go into the oven. When they're done, I cut them up, package them for people. But one of these times I found out I made salted brownies. Oh, hardly any sugar, lots of salt. Not what I like to eat. Cannabis is the same way. It has many different ingredients. Some of them are good for one thing, some for another. We can see that food is one of the things that comes out of cannabis, but so do molded plastics for chairs and textiles, paper. We have so many things that are written on cannabis paper, hemp paper, construction. Animals are eating it. Cannabis has two basic sections to it, medical cannabis and industrial. When we're in the medical section, what we're seeing is help for our bodies, our minds. In the industrial section, we're looking at all sorts of useful items that won't get you high. Cultivars or strains as we talk about them exist both in medical and industrial because they're all part of cannabis. It just depends on what their ingredients are, whether they stay on the medical side or the industrial side. In the industrial side, most people know about hemp. They think of it for textiles. They think of it for topical medicines. In the medical side, the cultivars or strains tend to be used more for the medical part of our body and our psyche, our emotions. We look at the sativas that are uplifting and the indicas that are more relaxing. Within each of those strains or cultivars, and there are hundreds and thousands of strains and cultivars, there are cannabinoids. What a fun word to say. Cannabinoids exist in cannabis, both on the medical and the industrial side. The two that most people have heard of are THC and CBD. And back to those proportions, THC is higher in general than CBD in medical cultivars. The industrial side has a smaller proportion of THC and higher of the CBD. So they can be very similar or very different for their use. Within those cannabinoids, within the cultivars, there are terpenes. So we continue to break it down finer and finer so that we know what effect each of the cultivars will have on our body and our brain. I suffer from depression, but not much anymore. I've discovered the proper terpenes. And so I look for cultivars 
that have the terpenes in it that I need. Limonene, fabulous antidepressant. I take a cookie that I make that contains the cultivars that have the terpenes that I like. So linalool is one of the ones that I look for. Limonene, antidepressant, anti-anxiety. It keeps me calm for the day. In the evening, I look for cultivars that have pinene in them, an anti-inflammatory. It helps me sleep and not worry about my pain. I'm very lucky that cancer does not run in my family. But what they have been finding in research is deterpinoline is a wonderful anti-cancer medicine. And it doesn't have all of the horrible side effects of chemo. Know what's in your cannabis. Know if you're eating a salty brownie or having a cannabis experience that contains too much of one terpene or another. Make sure your proportions are there.
please join me. Ask questions, come out of the dark with me. Uh, hello, Dale. Thank you so much for that presentation uh, and breaking down how each terpene helps with you. And I think it makes it relatable for other people who don't quite know about them. And thank you so much for everything that you've been doing and for taking on the Kauai event all by yourself and running it there. And I'm sure you have support too, but I just thank you so much. It, it really means a lot and it really helps get access to patients on all the islands. Um, which is our goal. Our goal is to make sure that we can get this information out to as many patients as possible to get them educated and growing. And continuing with access to patients, up next we have Empress Modwape Ulafumi Jacobs. She has been an event organizer with us, helping us continue getting this event accessible to patients. Uh, Empress provides cannabis literacy through advocacy, education, and health and wellness coaching. She has seen the power of transformation in her own life and caring for her mind, body, and spirit with diet, exercise, and cannabis, as, and she is passionate about helping others do the same. Empress empowers others by educating and supporting them in their intentional use of cannabis as medicine. And here is Empress coming from the Big Island to share her mana'o with patients. I'm Empress Madupwe, founding member of Balm of Gilead Cannabis Health and Wellness Ministry, also known as Balm OG360 LLC, a family business founded on legacy history here in the Kingdom of Hawaii. I'm here to give thanks for the cannabis plant, the herb, especially the kind grown here in Hawaii. Cannabis is a plant that I regard as my mental, physical, and spiritual sustenance. For over 40 of my 65 years of life, I have intentionally used cannabis as medicine to treat anxiety, chronic pain, depression, and migraines, ailments that I've struggled with through adolescence as well as my adult life using prescribed medications. Currently, cannabis is my supplement eating mostly, using it while eating mostly plant-based nutrition, practicing movement, mindful meditation, and other uh, modalities of healing. Um, through the use of cannabis, I've decreased my use of prescribed medicine for the conditions I've described. As I continue to learn more about the plant, as well as my body and my endocannabinoid system, and tracking my dosing and intentionally connecting with the plant, I find I am reaching closer to my goal of zero prescribed medications for chronic pain, as well as the other ailments I described. Cannabis is, in my opinion, why I'm alive today and here to celebrate this monumental event, Medical Cannabis Day in the Kingdom of Hawaii. I want to acknowledge and celebrate with the Hawaii Patients Union. Um, I celebrate their diligence and steadfastness in advocating and sacrificing their energy, time, and resources to raise awareness on the rights of medical cannabis patients in Hawaii and the rest of the world by extension. I'm um, sharing my testimony here in support of the Hawaii Patients Union and all those who continue to advocate, agitate, educate, and empower the people to work towards changing current unjust legislation. We need laws and policies that ensure all medical patients and adult cannabis consumers the right to access, to cultivate, to possess, and also to produce medicine from cannabis without fear or threat of criminalization. We need new policies that will guarantee reparatory and restorative justice for those individuals, communities, and families that were criminalized and marginalized by the war on drugs for their association to the plant. We need new legislation that will create an environmentally friendly and sustainable cannabis industry laws that would effectively end prohibition and regulation of the herb cannabis, thereby restoring our divine and legal rights to utilize this marvelous plant, herb 
called cannabis as we do any other food in nature. In this respect, I again want to express my gratitude to the Hawaii Patients Union and all those individuals, groups, organizations, and businesses who work tirelessly towards ending prohibition. Bomb of Gilead Cannabis Health and Wellness Ministry, also known as Bomb OG360, supports and salutes you. Um, Brent, who do we have next? You next there? up, we've, I'm here, Maggie. Thank you. Next up, we've got uh, Devon Ward from the Marijuana Policy Project. Um, Devon stepped up and offered to um, help sponsor the event today. He's the senior legislative counsel at the Marijuana Policy Project, and they work hard to change state and federal laws um, that allow people to basically determine um, their own level of freedom with cannabis. And uh, what they're shooting for are policies without federal interference. So while the patient's union works at county and state level in Hawaii to help protect and inform patients of their rights, Devon and the MPP team work on all the states. So they work at the federal level to put humane cannabis policies for medical use of cannabis in all 50 states and US territories but they do much, much more. And here to help us learn more about those efforts, um, we've got uh, Devon Ward. So without further ado. Aloha, and thanks for that introduction. My name is Devon Ward and I serve as Senior Legislative Counsel for the Marijuana Policy Project. MPP, which was founded in 1995, is the largest organization in the US that's focused solely on enacting humane cannabis laws. MPP has been responsible for changing most of the state cannabis laws that have been reformed since 2000 including more than a dozen medical cannabis laws and the legalization of cannabis by voter initiative in Colorado, Alaska, Maine, Massachusetts, Nevada, Michigan, and Montana. MPP's team spearheaded the campaigns that resulted in Vermont and Illinois becoming the first two states to legalize cannabis legislatively in 2018 and 2019. MPP also played a leading role in passing the most recent legalization laws to pass via state legislature in Connecticut and Rhode Island. As you likely already know, Hawaii was the first state to permit medical cannabis use by a legislature. However, over 20 years later, much work remains in the fight for medical cannabis rights in Hawaii. Despite being the first state to adopt medical cannabis by a legislature, Hawaii law still allows lawful cannabis use as a basis for DUI charges. More troubling is the fact that lawful cannabis use continues to be used as a factor in child custody, state licensing, parole and probation, and employment decisions. We must continue the fight to ensure medical cannabis patients have the same rights as other medical patients. Lastly, in our pursuit for fairness for medical patients, it's important to remember that because of adult use cannabis prohibition in Hawaii, many people who would benefit from medical cannabis like veterans and first responders are prohibited from partaking. Studies show in legalized states, most adults who consume cannabis use it to treat some medical ailment like insomnia, anxiety, depression, or nausea. And that's why myself and the MPP team will be pushing for full adult use in addition to protections for medical patients next legislative session. Uh, mahalo to the Medical Patients Union for their continued advocacy on the county and state level to ensure patient access. And I hope to see you all at the Capitol in the 2023 session. Mahalo. Mahalo for that, Devon. Thank you so much. And thanks to the Marijuana Policy Project. Looking forward to your support here in Hawaii for patients' rights. I'm over here at South Maui Gardens, and our next guest will be moving to uh, back to Maui um, in the coming months. And as family caregivers turned advocates, they were basically inspired by Chella's mother's decade-long journey through dementia. Uh, Chella and Dave Conan launched Cannabis Helps Dementia podcast. They started the All's Notes Crash Course for Caregivers. They wrote a movie script loosely based on their experience called Last Resort, an Alzheimer's pot dramedy. Their book, Owl's Notes, CBD for Seniors, 12 Essential Things to Know When Trying CBD, and Medicinal Cannabis to Ease Symptoms of Aging, is available now on Amazon. 
After more than 25 years working in film and television in Hollywood, it's now their mission to improve the lives of older people experiencing debilitating illness through care gap training and plant-based education. Everyone, please welcome Chella Fiorini. Happy Medical Cannabis Day, Chella. Happy Medical Cannabis Day, Hawaii. I'm Chella. My mom lived with Alzheimer's dementia for nearly a decade, and through that difficult journey, we learned about the awesome power of cannabis. When mom was diagnosed, she was put on many medications to attempt to treat her terrible behavioral symptoms. She was so agitated and anxious. She was on antipsychotics, an antidepressant, even anti-seizure medication, all of them dangerous black box drugs with increased risk of sudden death in elderly dementia patients. The anti-anxiety drugs caused an adverse event, so we couldn't use those. Mom's quality of life was terrible, and the whole family was suffering. When we asked her doctor about using cannabis, he said, Oh no, you can't use marijuana. It's bad for her memory. Through our lived experience with mom and now many other seniors, we've learned that CBD and medicinal cannabis help people living with dementia better than anything else available. The U.S. Department of Health held a patent on cannabinoids for neuroprotection since 2003, particularly as neuroprotectants, for example, in limiting neurological damage following ischemic insults, such as stroke and trauma, or in the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease. There are literally hundreds of published studies on how cannabinoids can relieve the suffering of millions of people living with dementia and ease the stress of their families and care partners. This is a breakthrough therapy. We need doctors and medical professionals to learn about the endocannabinoid system. The ECS is established in science and it's responsible for regulating all the other systems of the body. But very few medical professionals learn about this system and aren't required to take any continuing education on this vital system they missed in school. More than two-thirds of states have medical cannabis programs. Some of those states also allow adult use. Frankly, few if any of the states are doing medicinal cannabis right and patients are needlessly suffering or being forced to be criminals. Alzheimer's and related dementias aren't on Hawaii's list of qualifying conditions, but we don't have any other reasonable options. Cannabis helped my mom and our family from the time we started using it until her last breath. We have to expand access to all who want to try this life-changing essential medicine. Hawaii could create an independent, robust economy by embracing all the possibilities of hemp and cannabis without charging outrageously high taxes. Free the plant. Free the people. Aloha. Thank you, Chella. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for everything you do. Happy Medical Cannabis Day. Um, I also want to uh, share a piece of information that you shared with me the other day that I think is really helpful. Um, you mentioned to, if you have a family member with uh, Alzheimer's or dementia and you want to help them uh, get their dosing uh, easier to add it to a coconut milkshake, I believe you said, or smoothie, because uh, it helps bind the fats uh, to the right body parts to help them with the brain blood barrier yes <laughs> right and I think I got that right I'm not quite yes, sure it was very helpful we we definitely used cannabis in um a coconut milk based shake for my mom ketones are extremely helpful for people living with dementia um that alone actually can really make a huge difference in people living with dementia's lives and their families' lives. But most people aren't willing to change their diet so radically and give up sugar and things like that. So in lieu of that, you know, CBD and medicinal cannabis are extremely helpful and really should be a first line medication. Thank you so much, Shella. Well, absolutely, thank you so much. And um, we'll talk to you soon. Awesome. I had a question, uh, Chella, if possible. Um, I was kind of wondering what kind of time frames um, these events uh, with your mom were like, how long uh, was this happening for? Um, so my mom was diagnosed in 2010. Um, she had a lot of like wild behavior before that. Maybe some people in Hawaii might remember her. She was an acting teacher in Honolulu for a while and 
you know, she was, you know, notorious. Um, so she had a lot of behavioral stuff to begin with. And that's why it was, it was hard to diagnose her at the, at the beginning. Um, cause it just looked like worsening behaviors. Um, and so when she was finally diagnosed in 2010, uh, we didn't use cannabis for a while because the doctor, right, we told you. Um, but when we finally did, um, we started using, back in the day in LA, uh, they just had, it was unregulated um, medicine, cannabis medicine wasn't tested for the percent of how many cannabinoids were in it at the time, whereas now it really is. And it's so much easier to dial in dosing and stuff. So um, we started about a year and a half into her journey, um, really just medicating symptoms. Um, now I feel like um, if we used more CBD, because the Dr. Babak Baban did a study at Augusta University in Georgia, um, he basically injected these mice with the worst possible Alzheimer's disease, um, five FAD mice. They are bred specifically for this type of study, um, these types of studies with all different types of medications for people living with dementia. Um, he injected these mice with three or 400 mil, the equivalent of three or 400 milligrams of CBD for a period of two weeks over a mouse's life is more like several months or a year. I don't really know. I'm just a family caregiver turned advocate. Um, but a long time in people, sort of a three, 400 milligram dose in, in these mice. Um, when they sacrificed these mice and looked at their brains, these mice who were genetically bred to not have these pieces of their brains so that they can do these tests on them, were growing the pieces of their brains back. This is revolutionary stuff. And actually, if you go to Cannabis Helps Dementia podcast and look up Dr. Babak Baban's episode, you can hear him talking all about it. So um, I now think that if we used cannabis earlier in life that uh, in CBD, CBD dominant or THC, but really I think it needs to be a mix. I think it needs to be both. I think we need the whole plant for that neuroprotection like in the patent from 2003 that United States Department of Health actually discovered in 1998. Um, I think that we need the whole plant. So like I, I usually recommend um, you know, for people with um, severe anxiety and agitation, like my mom had, I'd recommend a one-to-one -one right now, but like low dose, like five milligrams. Um, there's lots of people in Northern California. I know 60 people in facilities in Northern California that are using a 20 to one, 20 milligram CBD, one milligram THC, or like a one-to-one, -one, like I just talked about at five milligrams each. Um, to really benefit their symptomatic issues. So um, to, long roundabout answer, my mom's journey was about a decade. And uh, at the end, the CBD really completely eased her death rattle. Um, she had very labored, very bad breathing because she was actually dying of, um, she was dying of aspiration pneumonia. So she was, you know, drowning. So her, her breathing was this really bad, 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 really hard to listen to sound. And I gave her just two milligrams of CBD, just two drops from a tincture rubbed into her gums and it completely eased her breathing. So, I mean, this is a really, really important nutrient in all of our lives. And I think especially as we get older with aches and pains and sleep issues and the change for women, Alzheimer's impacts women a lot more than it impacts men. And they think that it might be because of hormonal issues. So CBD really helped me through the change and medical cannabis helped me through the entire journey with my mom. So it's a long haul. CBD really helps caregivers. I really cannot recommend this medicine more highly to literally all people. It is so safe and effective, and it is only not helpful to such a tiny, 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 small fraction of people. So talk to your doctor. If your doctor doesn't know about cannabis, look up one of the doctors in Hawaii who does or go to the Society of Cannabis Clinicians or reach out to me. I'll happily connect you with a doctor that I think you might vibe with.
Does anybody else have any questions? <laughs> That's fantastic, Chow. I really appreciate that was. it. Um, and I appreciate the work that you're doing. And of course, anyone uh, that uh, wants, they should check out Chella's book, uh, Owl's Notes, CBD for Seniors, 12 Essential Things You Know, 12 Essential Things to Know When Trying CBD and Medicinal Cannabis to Ease Symptoms of Aging. You can pick that book up on Amazon. Um, thank you again, Chella. Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, we, we appreciate you guys and look forward to you coming over here to Maui. Um, yeah, so we'll be there soon. We'll be there no later than October. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, um, cool. Very um, cool. Also, I want to add that we are going to give away a couple of copies of the book that Brent just mentioned, CBD for Seniors, um, from Chella. We'll do it on Instagram, and she will mail it to you guys. Totally. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Bye. Thank you, and I'm wondering if we have, uh, if Chris is still on the line. Um, no, you're fine. Hold on, um, I, I'm working on it. Aloha, Chris. Um, Hi, all. <laughs> Chris, how's it? how's it, Chris? Um, for anybody who doesn't know, Chris is uh, Chris Sandy is the vice president of Hawaiian Ethos, our sponsor today. Uh, Hawaiian Ethos is a dispensary on the Big Island, and I know we've been talking a lot about dispensaries, uh, but Hawaiian Ethos really focuses on helping community and get community outreach, and it's 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 awesome. Um, and Chris is here today to talk about live rosins and uh, making making them. All right, cool. I think we're on. Chris, uh, Chris Sandy here from the Big Island, joining you from Hawaiian Ethos, and um, super excited to be here for this year's virtual presentation of Hawaii Medical Cannabis Day 2022. Uh, before I dig into a little talk story, I'm going to do about Hawaiian Ethos and some of the work that we're doing with solventless concentrates. I just want to acknowledge the Hawaii Patients Union and specifically Brent and Maggie who have worked really hard to put this event on. I know that they worked with a number of collaborators, uh, MPP, Marijuana Policy Project, Joyful Kauai, South Maui Gardens, uh, Kukua Seed, Jason at Wailua Care, um, honestly, and so many individuals who participated and volunteered their time really to make this event happen. So thank you so much for everything that you've done and everything that you continue to do to make content like this accessible to Hawaii patients. So with that said, uh, let's, let's dig into this and uh, we'll start the presentation. So the first thing I'm going to do is pull up an introductory slide. You should be looking at a visual here. And before I dig into the talk, I'm going to give a preview of what I'll be covering. I'll spend about a quarter of the time talking about Hawaiian Ethos in general, what the general company footprint is, where we grow, how we grow, our processing center, our retail stores, the kind of products that we made. But really, the bulk of the time I'd like to spend talking about solventless ice water hash rosin concentrates. This is the only kind of concentrate that we make at Hawaiian Ethos. We've specialized in it. Um, we've really kind of built our entire processing model around only working with solventless. And it goes into all the products, right? So if you've ever had our chocolates, our gummies, our full spectrum oil, our cartridges, capsules, tablets, anything, uh, that's value add or controlled dose um, starts from solventless ice water hash rosin. The way information is laid out in the presentation is, uh, yeah, of course, to bring transparency to how concentrates are created at Ethos, but really it's intended to be a roadmap or a step by step guide for local producers, right? So if you're a local grower, local medicine maker, maybe you're a small business making your own value added products. This is supposed to be a step-by-step -step guide into how we do solventless concentrates that might be helpful in your process. That's a short presentation, so we won't be able to cover everything. So if there's something that we miss or just like a data point that was really interesting to you uh, that we didn't cover, like you know what brand of rosin press to buy or what, what brand of bubble bags or uh, you know what temperature to store your hash or something, um, definitely reach out to us. Email ethos, you know, contact at hawaiianethos.com. Uh, or DM us on Instagram and uh, we could definitely help fill in the gaps in your process. 
All right, so let's dig in. We'll probably take this from seed to sale, so we'll start at the farm, and we'll just kind of move through each step of the process out to the stores. The farm itself is on the north side of the Big Island. Uh, we're in a growing district known for farming vegetables, and um, we're at about 2,600 feet. And the building itself is pretty huge. Uh, it's about a million cubic feet, and transparent roofing lets uh, light into the building and we can house quite a few plants there. The facility itself is only for growing, right? So it's a dedicated cultivation facility. We don't do any processing there. It's purely a farm. Everything that gets harvested there, whether it's for concentrate or it's eventually gonna become dried cured flour, as soon as it's harvested, is moved to our dedicated processing facility. PC2, as we call it, or Production Center 2, is a completely different kind of building, right? Uh, it's very different from the farm. The floors are epoxied, it's stainless steel, it's very clean, it kind of seems like a laboratory sometimes, FRP'd walls, and that's where we make all of our products. So that's where we'll make gummies and chocolates and concentrates and uh, tinctures and things like that. And it's also where we dry, trim, cure flour as well. So that's uh, our processing facility. Everything that comes out of the processing facility is then moved to our three retail locations. Those are in Kona, Waimea, and Hilo. And really what makes those locations amazing is the staff. Uh, we're blessed to have a dedicated team of people that are really passionate about helping patients. They're friendly, easy to work with, and um, their main goal is to help people find what they're looking for and integrate medical cannabis into a healthy lifestyle. Now, the non-flower products you'll find at Ethos stores are pretty diverse. They come in a range of potencies and formats, and some of the products we're most known for are our live rosin vaporization cartridges, our fresh press and cold cure concentrates, but the same full spectrum live rosin that makes those formats so special are also infused in all of our edible and topical formats as well. So our extraction process is really at the center of almost everything we do and that's a great lead into a step-by-step -step overview on how we make concentrates at Ethos. So this checklist is a step-by-step -step overview of the process and while it starts with harvest we'd be overlooking an important part uh, if we didn't talk about growing first. Cultivating strains that are healthy, terpene and cannabinoid rich, that have the right trichome shape, density, and structure are all really important keys. Um, you could see a 2 to 5x difference in rosin yield and big differences in rosin chemistry just by working with and growing the right plants that are specifically designed for this process. And it's worth knowing that these plants may be distinct from cultivars that make for good dried flower. Similarly, the right time to harvest a plant for making live rosin may be different than when you might harvest flowers that you'd ultimately intend to dry and cure. Now, in terms of specific strains or cultivars, you need to experiment with your own grow to kind of find out what works for you and, and kind of what gives you the best yields. But in general, you're looking for terpene rich strains with big trichome heads that are ready to easily release from the plant on the day of harvest. So that's just a nod to how essential the growing aspect is. Really cultivating the right strains and harvesting them at the right time makes a world of difference. All right, so back to our checklist. Um, so let's, let's start off with harvest here. And when we're talking about harvest, I wanna key in on this word live, right? So we're saying live ice water hash rosin. Anytime you see live in the beginning of a concentrate, it generally means that the starting point for the flower material that was used to make the concentrate was harvested fresh. So that means you're not working with dried, cured flower. So that could even be trim, right? If you wet trim a plant or something like that. In our case, not only are we using fresh frozen flour, we're using fresh frozen whole flour. And this distinction is important. For instance, when you're doing something different like hydrocarbon extraction or possibly working with propane or butane or CO2, you have a little bit more flexibility in the starting flour that you can use. You might use dried cured flour that you're no longer interested in keeping for that format, but for this process, it's important to use fresh frozen, we prefer whole flour or buds, harvested at their peak readiness. 
So once flour has been harvested, bagged, placed into freezers, it'll stay in that state frozen until it's ready to be taken out on hash washing day. On that day, the frozen buds are placed into a very cold bath. For us, this bath looks like a 40 or 50 gallon stainless steel drum that's jacketed and insulated and meant specifically for this purpose. And we're trying to keep the water in that bath as close to 32F or freezing as possible, where the mixture can still be lightly agitated, either by a machine or a person. And I'll just say that in our operation, 99% of the hash that we produced has been agitated manually using a stainless steel stirring paddle, which is done completely by hand. So at this point, it's probably good to jump to this slide and talk a little bit about what's happening in the ice water solution while you're agitating these buds. What we're doing while the flowers are suspended in this cold solution is separating the trichome heads, which are full of most of the compounds that we would like to see in our final rosin, things like THC, CBD, THCV, and a whole spectrum of other cannabinoids and terpenes. And what we want to do is isolate those trichome heads from the rest of the flower. So if you're looking at the image to the top right, that's a close-up of a cannabis flower, and you'll notice that it's covered in these trichome structures. Now, trichomes can come in a bunch of different shapes and sizes. These have very distinct stalks and caps, and the caps can, depending on when you harvest, maybe they're clear, they might be milky white colored, they might be golden brown. Uh, it just depends on when you harvest them and, and their readiness, but those caps can kind of look like water balloons at the end of each one of the stalks. So these trichome structures are distinct from the green leafy part of the plant, right? They're made of a kind of plant wax, and when those structures get cold, they get brittle, and they easily break free from the more fibrous green leaves, which become pretty flexible and flimsy when they're in the ice water bath. And at that point, trichome heads will just be freely suspended in the water solution, independent of the flowers. And that's exactly what we want. Now, to collect all the trichome heads that are suspended in the water, what we're going to do is drain the water in that basin from the bottom and let it pass through a series of differently sized micron mesh filter bags specifically designed for this process. And you can buy these bags online. If you're going to wash pretty regularly or at large volumes or you're doing real production work, uh, I'd recommend buying really good ones uh, that are well constructed to hold up over time. We use Bolt bags. There are a lot of good brands, but uh, the inexpensive ones, if you're using them a lot, will tear. When you're buying bags, you may notice that they come in a variety of sizes. You might get as many as 10 different size bags, different micron mesh sizes in a set. Because we're a production shop, we don't use that many bags. We'll only collect trichomes from two or three different mesh sizes or cuts as we call them. Uh, anything over 200 microns is gonna be waste or kind of less desirable material uh, or you know leaf, bits of leaf and plant parts. And, um, and the cuts that we do keep will kind of be dynamic to the plant that we're working with. So over time, you'll get to know your plants and you'll probably be able to predict what volume of trichomes you tend to expect to capture from a certain mesh size or fraction from a specific cultivar. So each plant is unique and different and you'll get to know your plants and your operation. And you'll kind of decide what cuts you want to keep based on the final product that you're going for. So you'll know in advance, I want to make vaporization carts or I want to make cold cure live rosin. And you'll sort of be able to pair the plant, the specific cut you want to capture, how you want to treat it in order to get it to that final product in the state that you're looking for. So once we've collected these trichomes sorted by size in the mesh bags, we technically have something that's pretty close to hash, right? It's just a collection of pretty much pure trichomes. But what we're dealing with is something that has the consistency of wet sand. And hash at this stage has a lot of water in it, which we want to remove before we can press it into rosin. Now, there are a bunch of different ways you can remove the water. You could use a commercial or a home dehydrator. You could let hash out on a flat surface and let it air dry over long periods of time. But these methods can potentially oxidize hash, changing its color, or the use of heat over long periods of time might even decarboxylate or change the chemistry in ways that you wouldn't want. 
So for this stage, we lyophilize or freeze dry, which is a process that essentially sublimates the water off slowly over long periods of time, maybe as long as 24 to 36 hours. And that process takes place in a vacuum at very cold temperatures, well below zero. What comes out when it's finished is ready to press rosin from. It has the consistency, something more like dry sand, and that's exactly what we want. So in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, that image is actually just a scoop of dried trichomes, right? So that's exactly what you get. And what you'll notice there is that there really isn't anything else. It's just trichome heads, maybe a few stalks that had gotten through, pretty much no leaf matter. Um, it's just the trichome heads that were isolated through the mesh bag system. So the next part of the process for the dried trichomes, the hash that we've now created, is to press it into rosin, essentially. And if you kind of remember when we were talking about trichomes and that outside waxy layer that kind of holds them together, that's really what we're going to want to remove with the rosin process. What we're essentially doing here is heating up those trichomes. The cannabinoids, the terpenes, a lot of the compounds that we want will sort of flow through the mesh and it'll leave the wax behind. And that separation process produces a really clean final product. So the way this works is that we're essentially going to take all of those trichomes, that hash, those trichome heads, and we're going to place them into mesh bags. Sometimes they're made out of stainless steel, but mostly we tend to use nylon bags. So we'll place them in the nylon bags, and those nylon bags will be packed pretty tightly, um, and you'll get a feel for it, right? This is kind of the, the art of rosin pressing. You don't want to pack too much and, and add too much pressure and accidentally um, make your bags explode. <laughs> that happens to people. Um, that's definitely something you'll see on YouTube. Um, they call it a blowout. And so you want to avoid that, but you'll, you'll learn to pack the bags. And, um, and when we're pressing, uh, our goal is really just to press with the absolute least amount of pressure and heat uh, possible, right? So we're basically slowly turning up the heat and we're slowly turning up the pressure until we're kind of hitting this perfect sweet spot where the trichomes start to grease up and rosin starts to pour from the machine. As soon as the rosin is, is pressed from the machine and you kind of see it start dripping out onto wax paper and it looks like we've, we've gotten all the rosin that we're going to get from that particular batch of trichomes or that hash, we immediately put that wax paper in the freezer where it'll stay until it's ready to move on to the next step. Now at this phase, essentially what we have in the freezer is our ice water hash rosin, right? And we've kept it cold this entire time. And the way we've kind of laid this out, I just want to point out that every part of the process we put a ton of attention into keeping it cold and preserving the delicate compounds that were present when we harvested the plant right so we harvested we immediately put it into a freezer that was transported cold to our production center once it was at our production center it stayed cold and we put it, put it in an ice water bath after it came out of the ice water bath we put it in a really cold uh, lyophilization or freeze drying unit as soon as it was out of there it went back into the freezer uh, until it was ready to press and then as soon as it was pressed it went back into the freezer. Here's the thing, if that rosin is something that you're going to purchase as a pulmonary concentrate, let's say you want to purchase it exactly as it is at that state, that's what our fresh press live rosin is, right? And so basically before we deliver that fresh press live rosin to the stores, we transport it cold, right? So we transport it from the production center on ice to the retail store. And once it gets to the store, it goes immediately into the refrigerator. And the point of managing this whole cold chain is really to make it so that when you purchase that product, you're getting it in a state that's as close to the chemistry of the plant on the day that it was harvested, right? This process of managing a cold chain to deliver full spectrum solventless ice water hash rosin concentrates. Yeah, it's what goes into our fresh pressed live rosin, but really it's the basis for the rosin that goes into all of our products. And so that full spectrum component is important and here, here's why. I think a lot of studies and research around cannabis as medicine have shown that there's definitely benefits to what is called the entourage effect, right? To this sort of gestalt effect of the complete mixture of 
different cannabinoids, different terpenes, polyphenols, all present in the flower when it's harvested at peak readiness. And keeping those available and being able to preserve and deliver them intact to patients in the final product is really our goal in managing this, right? So that's why we kind of manage the cold chain the way that we do. It's, it's really to preserve those volatile compounds, the, the delicate chemistry of the plant, all the way through the production process without adulterating with any other chemistry, right? So we're not exposing it to ethanol, butane, propane, CO2, nothing like that. There's no additional chemistry introduced. This is just water, pressure, a very small amount of heat, and managing that cold chain all the way through the process. Okay, so that's our end-to-end -end process for making concentrates at Ethos. We definitely tried to pack in as much detail into these minutes as possible, and I feel like we just started to geek out on all the cool things there are to explore in the world of solventless ice water extraction. Uh, definitely check us out on Instagram, stay connected to our newsletter, our blog, uh, to get the latest on what we're doing out here on the Big Island. If you have any follow-up questions, ideas, corrections, absolutely message us. We're always excited to learn and exchange ideas with community. One more time before we close out, I just want to send another big thanks to Maggie, Brent, and the Hawaii Patients Union, and everybody who worked to make this day happen. We're super honored to be here and participate this year and to share about what we're up to at Ethos. Truly, thanks to everybody for tuning in, and we'll look forward to seeing you all in the real world sometime soon. Stay safe. Aloha. Thank you so much, Chris. That was an awesome presentation. I think we just started getting into the beginning of ice water hash rosin. I, the photography was beautiful. The rundown was informative. Uh, and just want to really say thank you to Hawaiianitos for sponsoring this and making this possible to get this education out to patients um, and for coming to us with, uh, with us at the right time um, to make this possible. And we're just very, very, very thankful for you guys. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Appreciate this. Very cool. Very cool. It was a great presentation. If I could create a perfect world where I were making those products, that's um, that's the process I would follow. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also for those of you that uh, don't know, um, Hawaiian Ethos, um, as our event sponsor, really sort of kicked in at exactly the right time where um, we were proposing this experiment, where we were trying to connect three islands together. Um, Chris with Hawaiian Ethos said, yeah, we'll go along with the experiment. We'll try it out and, and took a chance with us. So we really, really appreciate that. Thank you, Maggie, for, for making all of that happen. Um, so thanks again, Chris from Hawaiian Ethos. I'm super lucky over here, Maggie. Um, over here at South Maui Gardens, we've got a Maui local, uh, Mary Bailey from She's the managing director at the Last Prisoner Project, and she's here with us live at South Maui Gardens. <laughs> Aloha, Mary. Um, and she will um, give us an update on what the Last Prisoner Project is working on and how um, other folks can get involved. So thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for having me today. I'm just so grateful to be here and for everyone that put this event together. Way to go, Brent and Maggie and everyone else that's been involved. Um, Chris, thank you for sponsoring with your company. Um, so for anyone that's not uh, familiar with Last Prisoner Project, um, we are a criminal justice reform nonprofit dedicated to releasing cannabis prisoners and helping them rebuild their lives. So I am... Uh, and one of the founders, um, we founded the org back in 2019. We're still a baby in the world of organizations. Um, so we're just almost at our three year an anniversary. Um, but in a nutshell, um, the programs that we've built uh, to assist people who are currently incarcerated um, versus our legal program. So we do have an eligibility process, but um, if you pass the eligibility process, um, which basically means that the overlaying charge of the reason that the person isn't in prison um, is specifically cannabis, um, that person has no violent priors, then they're most likely eligible for the program. And so we match pro bono attorneys um, with the 
constituents in order to file their compassionate release petitions and or their clemency petitions. So that's one. So, you know, here in the US, unfortunately, there are tens of thousands of people that are still incarcerated uh, for cannabis, and which is such a travesty. Um, so we've created these programs to hopefully assist folks. So we have assisted um, and, you know, many people getting released, but there's it's a drop in the bucket, right? Uh, there's still so many more people um, that really need help. Our big goal, of course, is mass pardons. Large amounts of people being released at the same time. That's what we really need to happen. So we're pushing at that both at the federal level and the state level, but it takes time and it takes work. And um, we have an entire policy team now um, who is working on, on those efforts as well as others. So um, a big focus that we have is, it's called retroactive relief. And basically all of these states that go uh, go legal, pass legal le legislation, um, it's not the norm that people who are currently incarcerated are released, um, which is ridiculous. Um, and so that's something that we're really pushing for. Even last week, last Thursday actually, in the country of Thailand, over 3,000 3, prisoners, um, which is amazing. Um, and so we should be doing that, right? So that's something that we're working towards. Um, we've been really blessed. Um, we've I work with hundreds of cannabis companies across the country country and these cannabis companies uh, help donate so we can do the work that we're doing um, so like I was saying we do have a, an entire policy team that's working towards retroactive relief um, we recently in the state of California um, we spot we worked with uh, assemblyman um, assembly woman excuse me Mia Banda who is the AG's uh, wife um, and we spawned a bill for specifically for automatic expungement in the state of California. Um, we also launched a resentencing bill in the state of Virginia this year. Unfortunately, it died um, in the House, but again, we'll try again next year. Um, so, of course, everything we've been talking about for several years as a, a Hawaiian, a Hawaii resident, um, I want to help people here in our own home state. Um, currently, the way that people get in touch with us for legal services is they go on our website and they fill out our legal intake form. So far, nobody from the state of Hawaii has filled out that form. So I'm having a, a call to action for all of you. If you have any friends or you have any family members who are currently incarcerated um, for a state of Hawaii cannabis charge. Um, I'll know a lot of people are unfortunately and tragically shipped to Arizona. Um, but if you know anybody who's currently incarcerated in this state of Hawaii, specifically for cannabis, um, I welcome you to and entice their family to reach out to me. My email address is mary at last prisoner project. Dot org. If you remember that, that's okay. Just uh, tell them to write um, us on our info account. They could just go to the website and send us an email. I'm really, really wanting to connect with uh, families who need our assistance here in Hawaii. On totally fine. Um, and again, you know, the criteria is the person needs to have no violent priors on their record for our legal assistance um but you know please have them get in touch with me and we can talk about their situation um another big service that we have um direct service that we offer grants to either formerly incarcerated we also put funding onto the commissary accounts of prisoners um Frustrated. Most people think that everything is taken care of, but if you want to stay in touch with your family members, if you want soap, if you want shoes to wear, it all costs money when you're incarcerated. Um, and so a lot of people have lost touch with their families and they don't have family support. So we do put funding onto the commissary accounts of the prisoners who are in our legal program, in our advocacy program. We also um, most of the prisoners that I work with who are currently incarcerated, most of them are parents. And now their children are generally in single parent households and they need financial assistance. So they're eligible for grants from Last Prisoner Project as well. Um, I am 
incredibly proud of the fact that since the inception of our project, we have dispersed $1.5 million in grants directly to impacted families. Um, those are through funding going to the commissary accounts. Um, that is for direct grants for returning citizens or people who have been released for quite some time, but they need some financial assistance, um, as well as the children of currently incarcerated families. Um, again, I welcome you guys. If you want to learn more about the project and other current campaigns that we're working on, um, go to the Last Prisoner Project website. At the top, you'll see a take action page. Um, on that take action page, there are campaigns. There's ways to write letters to prisoners. I cannot tell you um, what a huge impact it is to take five minutes of your time and send a letter to a prisoner. You can actually do it from our website and we will print and mail the letter for you. You can do it from your cell phone, your laptop. We'll handle the mail. Um, you just have to write it. You just fill out the form. And really all of the prisoners that I work with who are now free, they tell me that receiving those letters when they were incarcerated really gave them the hope that they needed to keep going. Um, because as you can probably imagine, it is lonely. It's a lonely, sad place to be, especially for a plant medicine that really just helps people, especially for plant medicine that is now a, you know, what is it, a $25 billion industry um, and legal in so many states across the country. So it's really up for all of us as advocates to make sure that these cannabis prisoners know that there's people outside fighting for their freedom and that they have not been forgotten. So I really welcome you guys all to go to the Last Prison Project website, take a couple minutes to send a letter. It really makes such a huge difference. Um, and there's also on the Take Action page, if you're interested in sharing more information from your own platform, there's really simple ways to obtain social media graphics, infographics about this issue and about the work that you can share from your own platform. So all of that's available on the Take Action page as well. Um, has questions, I welcome you to reach out to me for more information as well. Uh, you're on the island of Maui, let's meet for coffee, let's talk about it. Um, highly suggest for you guys also to follow us on socials if you don't yet. Um, Last Prisoner Project on Instagram, Facebook, um, any of the posts that really resonate with you and really touch your heart, share them from your own platform because that's really how you educate the public that this is an issue. It's up for all of us to make sure that our legislators know that when cannabis legalization happens, we have got to let people out. Um, these people deserve their freedom. This industry was built upon the backs of people who are currently incarcerated or have been incarcerated. These folks are the pioneers of this booming industry and we cannot let them behind. So um, thank you guys for letting me share today. Again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. Thank you so much, Mary. That was fantastic. Um, really appreciate uh, really appreciate what you're doing, what everyone's doing at the Last Prisoner Project. And um, it certainly is a cause for pause to think of how people are suffering needlessly in our prisons for um, supposed crimes that other people are actually profiting off of right now. Uh, it's, it's mind boggling. So thank you very much for for leading that charge. Um, up next, uh, we've got um, Senator Joyce and Blaine Ventura. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you here, Senator Blaine Ventura. And um, for those of you that don't know, um, Senator Joy, as we call her in Pune, uh, is from our second senatorial district, and she is on the human services. Uh, commerce uh, and consumer protection, and of course, health committee, as well as a dual use task force member. So um, get your questions ready in the chat. And um, I guess what we're looking for, if possible, um, Senator Joy, is maybe an update uh, from the legislature from your perspective and how medical cannabis patients are being positively or negatively affected. So, so th thank you so much, Brent. Um, yeah, as as the history is for my legislative history is even as a freshman, I was involved in the 
conference committee that establishes the medical marijuana dispensary um, bill. So, so I'm really quite well aware of the problems we have with the bill. I'm really quite well aware about the headwinds we face with this administration and getting it far more liberalized than it is now. But so um, before you start sending me brick bats, okay, let me tell you what has happened. Um, for those of you who know me, I've always been for legalization and knowing that the administration is not for legalization, at least decriminalization. And, um, and we were able to succeed in that in 2017 up to three grams, you know, um, I had pushed for at least one ounce, but um, in, when people say we are a one party control legislature, uh, what they don't realize is that within our party, we continually fight amongst each other as to what um, bills that we go through. But anyway, what has passed this session? Um, not much, because we are all very well aware that the more liberal we try to make it, even though there were bills seeking legalization and decriminalization, those were not heard. Um, because we are re really well aware that the governor um, will veto anything more than what has already passed. So um, baby steps, one of the baby steps that we passed was basically to increase the number of production centers and, and actually, if you're not gonna allow for legalization, at least increase the licenses, um, but Department of Health is unwilling to do that at this time. So we've increased the, with HB 2260, we've increased the production centers to three. The interesting part about that is even though we still have a vertical integrated um, system, if you look at the actual bill, it refers to the medical cannabis dispensary being allowed to subcontract to no more than three production centers and up to two detail, retail locations. So it implies, and I strongly suggest that um, maybe with the next administration, we will move forward to, with at least a horizontal allowing for more people to be able to take advantage of the marijuana industry and not just the eight with the dispensary licenses. Makes cannabis illegal. So since the air, you know, is controlled by the FAA, which is federal, um, it's still technically illegal to transport medical marijuana. Although as a lawyer, I'm gonna tell you that generally speaking, whether or not they actually enforce small amounts, um, I haven't seen them try to, en to enforce the conviction of small amounts, personal use, you know, a couple joints, further delayed the pilot project. So that one we've con we're continuing the hemp production on that one. But we've also passed um, my bill, my resolution, requesting the Legislative Reference Bureau to conduct a study on the relationship between the current prices of an access to medical cannabis and the volume of illicit cannabis sales in the state. And my purpose from doing, for doing that is to show that basically, if we legalize it, hopefully we can decrease the price of medical marijuana but, and have proof to show that there is such a correlation, even though it's logical that something like that um, should occur. So hopefully with that kind of, um, with that kind of study, we can push towards um, legalization to show that more patients will be able to access marijuana and that then by basically legalizing it, then you know the, hopefully we can decrease the illicit trade 
and this whole reason for um, bringing in um, medical, I mean, marijuana, and hopefully there will be no such thing as, mar as marijuana criminals, right? That's the whole idea behind that. Um, we're all waiting for the new governor and we're all hoping that the new governor with the new administration will be more progressive. Um, you know, state of Hawaii was the first state to legalize medical marijuana, but we're like the last state to even consider having a retail dispensary. So, um, in one sense, we're progressive, but in a lot of sense, we're really quite conservative. Uh, do you folks have any questions? I mean, really not much happened this legislative session. We're all just waiting for a new governor. Yes, uh, um, I agree I with what CBD for Senior says. I have some questions, I think. Monica, do you see any questions? Yeah, um, I agree that the current tent plant is low. Um, you know, medical patients, help protected our medical patients in the current system. Um, basically because of the tent plant um, requirement, uh in the um and the fact that we are preventing we are preventing um there's going to be a sunset as to whether or not caregivers will be allowed to grow for patients excuse me sheldon i'm in a zoom i'm sorry about that um but basically um we're, we're, we're not that protected right now. That's why I said we, we need to look at hopefully a new administration who will be um, more lenient and more understanding and more empathetic about the needs of our, of our patients and the need for basically affordable medicine, which is not happening right now. I, um, how many of the governor candidates are sympathetic? I think you better go ask each one of them. Um, I, I don't want to, to, to say what their platforms are. Yeah, um, I agree that not all patients can grow. That's the reason why I have always been pushing for to allow caregivers to be able to go for their patients um, and that's where we are right now. I mean, basically, hopefully, um, we, we but at least by the current law, we're forestalling the date as to when caregivers will be prevented from going for patients. Okay. Thank you, Thank you um, with cannabis nurse Wendy, <laughs> for saying that. But I, I believe that is a question that should be asked of all governor candidates. And we really need to press them, not only on legalization, but if not legalization, decriminalization, and what do we do about without, um, without punishing those who want to take advantage of it, yeah? Um, I don't think we're gonna be seeing cannabis being reimbursed by insurance until the federal law accepts the fact until the federal law is changed. And I agree with William Collins. Um, I have tried descheduling before and have failed. And like I said, I'm waiting for the next administration. Thank you so much, Senator Joy Ventura. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for everything that you continue to do for patients. And being on the task force and representing patients on the task force. Thank you so very much. Okay, yeah, we're, we're hoping that the task force um, will, will at least shed some light as to a path forward for the new governor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and I agree with Dr. Otto's, Otto's idea, um, but so far the state hasn't been asking for an exemption. Again, we're waiting for the next governor, right? Right. Okay. 
Thank you so very much. Thank you for inviting me, and I wish I had better news. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Senator. Okay. Um, thank you so much. So here at Care Wide Lure today, we actually have former Honolulu City Council man Ikaika Anderson. He's a single dad of four Keiki and he's a candidate for Lieutenant Governor of Hawaii. So it's a great time to hear about his opinions on medical cannabis and patients. Um, Ikaika lives in a multi-general household mother and his 87 year old grandmother who raised him. Um, so thank you very much. And here's Ikaika Anderson. Aloha, ahi, ahi, kako. Very pleased and honored to be here with you folks this evening. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk story with you. I'm here at Kerawailua with my friend Jason Hanley and the great team that he has here at Kerawailua. I was blessed a couple months back with the opportunity to come here and talk story with Jason about cannabis policy and to see exactly what he's doing here. And I have to say that the operation that I've seen here is absolutely impressive. And the people that he touches and that his team touches and the lives that they touch are real. These are real people here who have a solid benefit to improve their lives. I'm here because I'm extremely interested in cannabis policy. And I'm looking forward to learning more from my friend Jason and from his cohorts as well. But what really got me interested, as mentioned, I'm a caregiver for my 90-year-old grandfather and my 87-year-old tutu. And my family, like so many across Hawaii, were, have been racked with opioid addiction. Huge problem across our state. And I see marijuana as a better way forward. But before just coming forward and introducing policy, I want to talk to folks like you who are out here in the field, who have the knowledge, the expertise, who are willing to work with policymakers. Now, also, as mentioned, I'm a former Honolulu City Council member. I served as the chair of the Honolulu City Council. Marijuana policy, cannabis policy is at the state level. So I've never really had the opportunity to be hands-on with this policy because the counties have no jurisdiction. Over it. But at the state level, that can change. And I look forward to being able to engage with the good people here. Also with all of you who are on this call, I'd like to learn more, that's why I'm here. I want to learn so often in my years in government service, I see policymakers come forward and tell you, listen to us, we're gonna tell you what's best for you. That's not how responsible policy is made. That's not how good policy is made. Policy is always best when you come out and talk to people who are in the field who are the experts and who have access to the experts. That's how responsible good policy is done. So I'm looking forward to continuing to learn more. It was great hearing from Senator Joy this evening with the information that she has, being involved as a veteran state lawmaker now, uh, going from the state house now to the state Senate. I'm hopeful to, to continue to, to work with people and I look forward to learning more. So again, thank you folks very much for the opportunity. And I'm going to be here at Kerawailua for a bit tonight to talk story with everyone and look forward to, to being able to learn more from you all. But thank you folks very much for the opportunity and look forward, look forward to being able to talk story more. Mahalo Nui. Mahalo Ikaika Anderson. Thank you so much. Thanks for your thank manao. You. Thank you for sharing. I need to check and see if we have May with us. We have Nurse May. Hey Maggie, can we do? Can we give away some more seeds over there? We're giving oh, yeah. away a ton of seeds over here. <laughs> I have seeds. Does anybody oh. want seeds? <laughs> so anyone, anyone that shows up at, at uh, Oahu or Carolina um, yeah. Farm or here in Kihei on Maui at South Maui Gardens, we have seeds. We have, we have amazing growers here on site. And I know you have some amazing growers over there. Too. 
and uh, we're getting super pumped up for the growers panel that's coming up what at 6 30 is so um we got uh john ipolani next with uh, a story that he submitted all right so i'd just like to shout out my testimony out there and just to say that um the plant cannabis has really really helped me along with um my life as far as developing and basically being aware of myself cannabis has unlocked that for me and um, working with the plant has truly has truly opened my eyes and instead of viewing marijuana as a drug weed you know nowadays i view it as medicine and i try to educate the kiki about it and the benefits of it so yeah cannabis has truly helped me mahalo nui for your manao john and thanks for sending that video in and it looks like it's time for a seed giveaway see i have okay does anybody know the name of the governor that signed the medical cannabis bill into law if you do you get a pack of seeds <laughs> yeah it was 22 years ago <laughs> hey you guys all have phones you can google it ben cayetano correct <laughs> So what kind of seeds uh, did they win? What kind of seeds do you want? Which ones do you want? <laughs> Get some from Matchmaker Genetics. Yes. Matchmaker, I think Matchmaker. Yeah, yes, Matchmaker Genetics. <laughs> okay, um, I'd like to just share a little bit of gratitude um, for Heather Golden uh, here at South Maui Garden. She has worked um to make our stay here really nice so shout out to heather golden from south maui gardens and, and of course uh, Bo um and uh, all the folks here this is really an oasis in the middle of south kihei here on maui and it's just an amazing place and we've got a great vibe going on um great discussion going on in the background and um, some great, uh, some great cannabis exchanges going on. So, just want to say thanks to South Maui Gardens and um, yeah, over to you, Maggie. For any of you who do not know, this is Nurse May. She is a board certified by the American Association of Nurse Practitioners, is licensed by the state of Hawaii to provide family certified health care to patients of all. And she, I just want to also add that she is has an amazing and educational TikTok series on social media that I really encourage everyone to follow. It is awesome. So, and she is here to share with, with us a history of cannabis in Hawaii. And I are so stoked to have you. Thank you so much for being here. I am going to be just giving a brief but long history of um, cannabis in uh, the kingdom of Hawaii. So let's get into it. Um, so I just wanted to start with uh, a little um, story about Captain Cook. So for a lot of people, this is kind of the 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 belief of when potentially the beginning of um, cannabis happened in Hawaii. It's the thought that um, Sir Joseph Banks brought it over in 1779. Uh, as many of you know, may or may not know, Sir Joseph Banks was uh, very much a, a hemp enthusiast and he was uh, Captain Cook's botanist. Uh, he went on the first voyage with Captain Cook, but on the one that they were in Hawaii, where Captain Cook um, didn't didn't leave Hawaii, uh, he was actually not on um, on that voyage. So, um, I actually think um, what is more uh, appropriate as far as like how cannabis came to Hawaii is 
up next. Um, so let's see here. So I think it's probably more probable that um, cannabis came to Hawaii actually with whalers. Uh, so from 1820 to 1860, Hawaii was the center of whaling throughout the throughout the United States. Um, and really the biggest ports for this was Honolulu, Lahaina and, and, uh, and Hilo. And the reason why I believe that it was whalers is um, because if you look at how whaling actually changed agricultural practices in Hawaii at that time, it completely makes sense. Um, so before uh, whalers um, came, there wasn't like a large um, agriculture market that wasn't, so it was like a lot of, um, you know, the, the foods that were based here in Hawaii, right? Uh, but when the, um, the whalers What's came, that? the whalers actually weren't in uh -huh. food, traditional foods. And so um, this is when we saw that kind wow. of transition to different agriculture. And um, so this is kind of what I believe that it, it came here to Hawaii. Uh, but the first actual documented um, whole, um, record of it in Hawaii is from 1842 with the Kanona, um, with this Hawaiian, uh, the Kanona Nona, which, sorry, I spelled it wrong on my slide. This was the first uh, Hawaiian language newspaper. And this was the first documented um, record of, uh, of cannabis in Hawaii. And this was in 1842. What I want to basically point out is that uh, cannabis was totally uh, legal and it was in the kingdom of Hawaii. Uh, and of course in 1893, uh, Hawaii Grover Cleveland um, attempted to restore uh, Queen Lilia Kulani, uh, but he was unable to. And some of those same uh, people who overthrow the kingdom of Hawaii really made that that pathway for uh, annexation and um, really for cannabis becoming illegal. Uh, so in 1900, Hawaii is annexed and becomes a, a US territory. In 1931, uh, when they when they say that one person can't make a difference, um, <laughs> point them in the direction of Harry Anslinger. Um, Harry Anslinger is essentially the the architect of uh, you know the the war on war on drugs specifically. Um, the war on cannabis. Uh, he had a very, very uh, aggressive and really very racially uh, motivated uh, attack on, on cannabis throughout the United States. Uh, and this is when we really saw the, the laws um, change. This was when Hawaii first uh, had prohibition laws on their books and it was in 1931 and it was uh, directly from uh, Harry Anslinger. And um, then in 1959, Hawaii becomes a state. And 1965 to 1976, this is really when we see the um, kind of the the heyday and really the the peak of cannabis breeding and cannabis growing um in in Hawaii for this time uh soldiers who who fought in Vietnam brought back seeds and this really expanded our uh, our genetics and our genetic profiles uh, and of course some of the most famous uh strains are were um were, were bred. So this includes Maui Waui, Kwai Electric, and, um, and Puna Butter. And then, you know, all good things um, can be interrupted. So this is the format, the formation of 
Green Harvest. Uh, people who live here are all very familiar with Operation Green Harvest. It's a multi-agency marijuana eradication program. It started in uh, Hawaii Island in 1980 and I'm sorry, in 1970 and it expanded statewide in uh, 1980. Some of the early Operation Green Harvests, uh, what it looked like. So they would have these guys in the helicopters, they would go and spot, um, spot, spot fields, fly low. Um, and this is when you would see the people repelling down, tying the cannabis, uh, pulling it back up, and then it would be taken out uh, to a waiting car to be uh, destroyed. They would usually um, destroy these with fire. Um, and then in 1978, so a lot of people don't know that Hawaii actually uh, passed a, a medical cannabis legalization bill in 1978. It was uh, the first in the nation. Um, and this legalized marijuana, uh, for medical use, and it put it under the, the, the oversight of the Department of Health. So this is the actual bill, um, and the qualifying conditions were, uh, cancer, asthma, and glaucoma. So it passed in 1978, but it was never enacted. Um, so... Then we get to Operation Wipeout. So 1989 to 1995, Operation Wipeout was perhaps one of the most aggressive cannabis eradication programs in the nation. Uh, so in 1988, our current Hawaii Attorney General Warren Price uh, published a, a survey of Hawaii's war on drugs, and he declared Hawaii a uh, high intensity drug trafficking area. Because we were um, considered uh, a high intensity drug trafficking area, um, we got a, a lot of federal funding and with a lot of federal funding, it really turned this style tactic. So they uh, would map it, find it, and then uh, eradicate it. Uh, uh, one year in 1987, they had over 21 million pounds of cannabis, uh, outdoor cannabis plants that were eradicated. Um, and one of the, the things that they did with this was uh, they retrofitted uh, helicopters to where it used to have um, you know, guns, but instead of the guns, it, they, they retrofitted it to spray glyphosate. Um, and from 1990 to 1995, there were uh, 3,220 people were charged with uh, commercial promotion of marijuana from growing. And out of that, we had about 526 convictions. Um, because it was multi-agency, there's no true record of how much this costs, but uh, through estimates uh, from different state agencies, they're thinking it was around $9 million um, annually for this program to exist. Uh, and then in 2000, what we're celebrating today, Medical Cannabis Youth, Medical Cannabis Day. So Hawaii became the eighth state to uh, to pass medical cannabis and we were the first to do so through legislation. Uh, so most people have done it through voter initiatives, uh, but we actually did it through uh, the, our, our legislators. Uh, and um, this bill was Act 329 to honor that original legislation that was created in 1978. And that's also why when we look at our cards, it's a 329 card because that goes back to really honoring um, those original legislatures and that original bill from 1978. Uh, then in 2008, we saw uh, the Peaceful Sky Initiative. So Peaceful Sky Initiative was actually a voter initiative that passed in um, 
Hawaii Island. And essentially what it did was defunded, uh, made it the, the lowest priority for law enforcement uh, for 24 plants and under 24 ounces. Uh, also in this same year, um, the Narcotics Enforcement Division, when our program was under the Narcotics Enforcement Division, uh, they sent a list of all of the certified uh, patients to the Hilo uh, newspaper. And that was done under the direction of Keith Kamita, who's now a, who now is uh, with one of our dispensaries. Um, 2010. So this was the Medical Cannabis uh, Working Group. So this was a really, really important group. They did a lot of amazing, um, amazing things. And, and um, some of the, the recommendations that they made uh, should really, if they're enacted, um, today would be so helpful. But um, this isn't everything that they did, but this was some of some of the highlights uh, creating the dispensary system. So the dispensary system that you see was part of this uh, electronic uh, tracking. And this is when the request from transferring it from the Department of Safety to the Department of Health came and really clarifying workplace and union rules. And this was the first time that we saw um, saw a working group really address cannabis um, and in the workplace. And here we are 12, 12 years later, 2022, several bills later, and we still don't have any, any workers' rights, which is something that's in, incredibly important. And hopefully, uh, you know, we can work on that this next session. Um, so Act 178, this is when... Uh, we saw uh, it increased the camp plant from seven to, to 10 and increased the usable amount and also legalized uh, paraphernalia, but most important, this is when um, it was transferred out of the Narcotics Enforcement Division and to the Department of Health. Uh, so in 2013, um, the ACLU published their report on uh, cannabis and Hawaii, and this is when they reported that Native Hawaiians are arrested for cannabis possession six times more often um, than their share of the population statewide. Um, and in 2015, some of the legislative uh, updates really focused around anti-discrimination language. This was really important um, because it really protects patients uh, when, with custody, federal housing, edu and education. And I still see patients at least monthly uh, for issues with, with custody, whether it's with uh, an ex-spouse uh, or even with, with CPS. Um, this also created the eight, eight licensees and the vertical model and allows APRNs to uh, certify for medical cannabis use. 2017, um, the first uh, dispensary opened in Maui, and then the first one in Oahu, of course, was uh, Aloha Green, and there are currently uh, no native Hawaiian owners or executives in our uh, current dispensary system. 2020. Um, this was huge. Uh, Hawaii decriminalized a uh, small amount of cannabis. So it, possession of three grams or less is uh, instead of being a, a misdemeanor and having a record, it's, it's a ticket with, with a fine. Um, and then in 2022, so Hawaii has its first equity bill and it actually passed. Um, and this bill uh, is really, you know, as 
a new kind of a future and vision for, for what can be possible. Uh, this bill asked the Hawaii Drug Policy Forum to study the effects of, of social equity throughout the, the nation and provide recommendations for Native Hawaiians and also for those who have been affected by the war on drugs, specifically the war on cannabis. And, and as you've seen through this presentation, the very, very aggressive cannabis eradication program that existed in our state. Um, and then last but not least, uh, so the future of Hawaii, we really have uh, the ability to, to build a future that is not only equitable, but is also profitable. Um, while, you know, not forgetting those, those people who, uh, who, who have suffered from the war on drugs. And that's it. That is my presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was thank you, wow, I so much. <laughs>
I'm um, sharing my testimony here in support of the Hawaii Patients Union and all those who continue to advocate, agitate, educate, and empower the people to work towards changing current unjust legislation. We need laws and policies that ensure all medical patients and adult cannabis consumers the right to access, to cultivate, to possess, and also to produce medicine from cannabis without fear or threat of criminalization. We need new policies that will guarantee reparatory and restorative justice for those individuals, communities, and families that were criminalized and marginalized by the war on drugs for their association to the plant. We need new legislation that will create an environmentally friendly and sustainable cannabis industry. Laws that would effectively end prohibition and regulation of the herb cannabis thereby restoring our divine and legal rights to utilize this marvelous plant, herb called cannabis, as we do any other food in nature. In this respect, I again want to express my gratitude to the Hawaii Patients Union and all those individuals, groups, organizations, and businesses who work tirelessly towards ending prohibition. Bomb of Gilead Cannabis Health and Wellness Ministry, also known as Bomb OG 360, supports and salutes you. Mahalo Nui and Prismo Duafe and everyone who holds cannabis on high. Uh, cannabis and whole plant medicine hold so many keys to our survival. So thanks everyone. Um, and those of you especially who treat uh, medicinal plants as being sacred parts of our journey here on earth. Um, thanks for helping us all to connect. We salute you, Empress, and your Ohana. Another deeply respected Ohana on Hawaii Island is the Ruggles family, and we caught up with Mike Ruggles just the other day after he was arrested in Fern Acres for an alleged cannabis DUI. Take it away, Mike. You know what I want to bring up today, guys, is I want to talk a minute about uh, cannabis uh, DUI arrests. Because recently, you know, I was I was asked to talk at a 420 thing, and uh, the Saturday before that, I'm on my way down to Home Depot, and I get pulled over, and because I have an extensive uh, cannabis arrest record, he pulled me over for no seatbelt, and when I... He came back from the car, he saw I had 57 felony arrests, and said, I smell marijuana, Mr. Ruggles, get out of the car. Next thing you know, I'm being arrested for cannabis DUI. Now, I was on the way to uh, replace my water pump at Home Depot, so I hadn't even medicated yet today because plumbing isn't my fortitude, and I was trying to keep my head squared because whenever I do a plumbing project, I always have to go back to the store at least once trying to keep my head together but I believe all cannabis users know the facts which is unless you're a novice cannabis user smoking cannabis and driving it doesn't affect your driving but anyway they put me through numerous tests and took my license and and I found out the facts which is this the Ninth Circuit which is what Hawaii is in in California it's already been ruled on they can't use the smell of cannabis as a reason to search your car it's not probable cause for search, nor is it probable cause for a DUI check. So keep that in mind. Furthermore, the bottom line on whether or not you're high comes down to, uh, I'm probably mispronouncing it, but amylites and metalites. Metalites is what a urine test can tell, and that can stay in your system for up to 45 days. The amylites only stay in your body for two to six hours. The only way to properly test for those is either a blood test or these new saliva tests. So, um, if you do get pulled over for cannabis DUI, it's good to know your rights. Let them know that it's not probable cause for that kind of thing. And also let them know that uh, uh, you're, you know, always cooperate. You want to cooperate. If you don't cooperate, they immediately take your license and it's gone for two years. 
If you cooperate and just give them a urine test, guess what? That's not conclusive evidence that you were actually high at the time. So remember that, folks, if you get pulled over. And remember this, be extremely careful. Because right now, uh, cannabis DUIs are way up. And it's the only thing uh, that, you know, if you're drunk, high on cocaine, alcohol, whatever, they don't take your car. Cannabis, they do. Administrative forfeiture. Right now, administrative forfeiture, they're taking over $5 billion a year. Last year, thieves only took $3.7 billion. Law enforcement confiscated $5 billion in administrative forfeiture. So keep in mind, that's what's actually driving this surge of DUI cannabis arrest, is that they make money on it. So be on the lookout for it. Don't keep roaches in your ashtray. And don't consent to its search. And remember, it's okay to give them a urine test because it don't prove nothing. If you want to appeal, you only, you have six days to mail your appeal with a $35 check to, so that you can get subpoenas. Uh, and if so, if they mail it to you on a Tuesday, it's impossible to get it there in six days. So you literally have to mail your appeal three days before they send in their decision. Otherwise, you won't make it in time. So keep that in mind, guys. You only got a six-day window. It's six days from when they mail the decision to get that appeal back into them. So yeah, you, you do the math. If you're on the big island, you can't do it. You gotta mail it early. All right, all right. <laughs> Mahalo, Mike. Thanks for sharing your mana'o and your experience during your recent cannabis DUI arrest. Um, if any of you out there are interested in the difference between when you should not talk to the police or self-incriminate or when you should cooperate with the police during a DUI stop, for example, where if you're uncooperative, they'll just take your license. Um, you should seek professional legal advice, um, and uh, that's the only way. There, there is not a single person in county, state, or federal government whose job it is to help you understand the laws that you have to abide by. So uh, you'll have to hire an attorney for that one. We have some great attorneys here in the state that might be willing to help. You can always ask us. But please don't take anything we say today as uh, legal advice. Seek professional help. All right. We have another great, very, this is a very special guest I recently met. Jana Silva is here with us at South Maui Gardens. And we just did a, a quick pre-record um, before the event started. And she has got a great mana'o. And she is very knowledgeable in whole plant medicines. And I'm hoping that we can learn more from Janice in uh, the coming weeks, months, and years. So uh, take it away, Janice. This is my mom, Janice Silva. Hi, we were just sitting here talking about how much I loved being a grower for patients. We did it for years in Bend, Oregon. My mom had Alzheimer's and it was just a tremendous resource for us and for her. Life just lit up for her. She ate again, had a twinkle in her eye, and it made the whole experience more enjoyable. And that was her only medication for many years. We really enjoyed growing for patients. But what happened was, as it went legal recreationally, the small farmer really took the, the biggest hit because there were so many new positions, brokers and delivery people and all these different costs that weren't involved and the small farmer got really choked out, unfortunately, and it became more of a big corporation type thing. This benefited the consumer, so it's not always an all negative, you know, one or the other. But as a farmer, I have to say, I wish that the farmer, the grower, that put so much love into this would be the one that was honored and respected and paid the most because without the farmer on the plant, we have nothing. And so many master growers are out there, including my son. He's such an awesome grower. And I love that we can be able to grow this plant and really benefit so many people. So support the grower. Grow at home if you can. I love cannabis. Mahalo for your mana'o, Janice. And we definitely encourage everyone to start growing, develop a relationship with the plant, 
Um, just growing the cannabis plant will set you off on a healing journey. It's a healing act of uh, nature, we believe, just to, to grow this plant. We recently caught up with Dr. Jack on Hawaii Island, and Dr. Jack is um, a, a doctor who operates in rural clinics. You may know him if you have sought help down in Pahoa from the Puna Medical Center. Um, he's also worked in all parts of the world, including Africa and recently in California. Um, so we asked him, um, you know, what, what, what's it like in California? How was uh, 420 in California this year? Thing to talk about it. Just if you were a user and an experience of it, you didn't need to talk about it. This year, it was all about selling my product. The problem uh, that uh, also went along with this, that was an outcome of this, uh, after discussing this with other friends of mine who are farmers in Mendocino, turns out that they no longer can produce their crops because of the regulations are so expensive to maintain registering with the authorities that is what's evolved unfortunately not fortunately or whatever it is, the natural experience is effectiveness was a grain market or a black market where their prices are so high that they can't afford to sell it at low price. They can't afford to do it. And so they've gone back to small little farms hiding from the authorities again. And it just turned out to be very negative. Wow. Anyway, that's enough at the moment. Enjoy your event. It was great to talk to you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Mahalo for your Manao, Dr. Jack. And we also uh, caught up with a cultural icon here on Hawaii Island, uh, Tomas Balski, and uh, he's an, a local artist. And, and so I asked Tomas uh, how he felt about cannabis in general. And this is what he had to say. Yeah, cool, man. So anyway, uh, after I graduated school, I, I went in Peace Corps to Brazil. And I met some very lovely ladies there. And they wouldn't romance me unless I smoked a joint with them, right? So I fell victim through their, through their charms, smoking weed, and it was like the duck discovering water, <laughs> right? And so I've been relatively uh, smoking dope, uh, upon occasion as an artist, for 60, more than 60 years now. Do you think people should be able to grow their own? Absolutely. Absolutely. Should there be any limits at all on cannabis? On, on cannabis? Probably, but I, I don't know any offhand. I mean, uh, I, I think there should be more limits on alcohol. I mean, you know, I, I don't, I, I drink occasionally. And I was a victim of a father who overwhelmed with alcohol and overwhelmed nine kids and the wife, so... I have a, a, a negative feeling toward alcohol and a very positive feeling toward, toward marijuana, you know. Uh, yeah. Aloha, Maggie. Um, we get the growers together here at South Maui Gardens. How's it going there? Good. I have to. Uh, you guys want to do the growers panel? Yeah, hold on. Hold on. Hey. Aloha mai kako. This is Brent. I'm over at South Maui Gardens. We've got some growers here for the growers panel. And I know that we've got some other growers. If you could unmute yourselves, um, anyone that's online. And what we're going to do is a round robin with our uh, growers panel questions. Yes, sir. I don't know. Can you hear us over there? Hey, we can hear you. Yes, sir. How are you? Good, good. Right on, right Thank on. You. Good to see you. you. I'm low. I'm low and I'm Jen. Hello, hello, and Jen. Thank you How for you? being here. We're good. It is uh, James, okay, upcountry, Makawal. Do we have James on the line? We'll get started. So I know we've got uh, Loretta and Andrew, and uh, we've got Aaron over here in South Maui. Uh, and Kalei, I believe okay. Kalei is coming to us from Karawai Lua Park. Okay. Um, and Lo, and then we've got Ben here at South Maui Gardens. Okay, 
Everybody ready? We're shuffling the deck over here so that nobody goes first uh, or last at each question. And uh, Loretta, we've got you up first. And so the first question is, um, you know, we have a lot of new growers and we're trying to support new growers. We're trying to bring more people into um, the growing community. Yes, sir. And so could you explain, uh, Lo, what uh, the relationship is between environment and the seeds that you choose and how important seed selection is for your outdoor indoor grow environment? And please take uh, 30 seconds to a minute. Brother, and... That's just a question for me, bro. All right. Environment is everything, brother. I mean, you know, if the seed don't grow, you know, it's not because of the seed. You don't, you don't say, oh, well, this seed ain't doing so good. You check the environment, you check the air, you check the soil, you know, you check the sun, you know, make sure your water is pH perfectly, you know, make sure that um, everything's all right for, for that plant, you know. So environment plays a very big role in growing. Um, there you have it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thanks, Mo. Up next, um, to answer the question of environment, um, environments or environmental's relationship with seeds and genetics, we got Will Grinnell. Will? Okay, yeah, environment, there's a lot to talk about with it, obviously. Um, I moved here 12 years ago thinking I was a pretty damn good grower. Right? And I was growing at that point in New Hampshire, doing both outdoor grow and indoor. And, um, I was really good at it. Boy, did I get my ass kicked when I moved out here. I learned, you know, learned about pathogens. Um, I learned about bugs. You know, I, I never knew what powdery mildew was. I'm growing pot for 50 years this year, actually. It's a great year to celebrate. And, um, you know, here was the first time. I mean, I had powdery mildew in my cucumbers and my tomatoes and my squash back, you know, in the Northeast. But it never hit the pot. You know, we were also growing strains that were really, uh, you know, we'd all been working with for 20, 30 years right in that eastern Maine, you know, New England area. And once we found a strain that worked and flowered early, of course, it all covered and constructed. So that, you know, related to the environment, you know, very much so back, you know, growing in the east, of course, up near the 45th parallel. And then moving here and relearning the whole process and having five and literally six seasons or cycles. If you don't take a day off and go to church. Um, but you know, slowing it down and doing five cycles a year. Even then, you know, we have just throughout the year. Um, you know, here in the North Shore of Maui, I'm at about 300 feet, and my, um, my good friend Ben here, he's up at 3,200 feet, and a lot of the same strains have such different profiles. Went up and stood right next to a plant. And not recognize it as one of our strains. So, environment is everything. Great, super cool. Thanks for that answer. And up next, uh, Andrew from Hawaii Island. You I think we just lost Andrew. Oh, I see him. Andrew, can we get to you to unmute your mic? I think. Uh, we lost him. I got it. Can you hear me? Oh, there he is. We can hear you. You can hear me? Yeah, I, I got jungle internet, so I don't know. Let, I guess just let me know if you're unable to hear me. You're good. We, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, is it my turn to answer the question? Yes, sir. The question is about environment and seed genetics. Yeah, so, I mean, I would have to agree with, I was unable to hear a lot of what Will said, but I heard like most of what Loretta said. And, uh, you know, I got to agree with both of them because I can relate. Um, I, I came here eight years ago and uh, I'm not going to say I was the best grower, but I was, you know, I, I had everything pretty dialed in where I was at in California. And uh, moving here was uh, very humbling because this is the toughest, most challenging place I've grown by far. And um, <clears throat> it was just a lot to learn. And uh, a lot of it just takes experiencing it, you know, and 
listening to little bits of advice from people that I'd met locally that did grow and uh, applying it to my own garden. So yeah, genetics is definitely the most important thing to uh, any grower, I think in any place, but especially in a challenging environment like Kauai, um, you really, you have to be picky, um, say in comparison to a place like Northern California where you can about grow anything without mold problems uh, as long as the weather's decent. And here, you know, it's just a lot less to choose from to be able to grow things that would survive the type of things that are thrown at them here, considering the rain and humidity and the pests and pathogens. So yeah, genetics first and foremost. And I uh, can't remember who said it along the way, but somebody told me, you know, you can't polish a turd. And uh, so if you're if a, the best grower in the world is given the worst genetics, they're still not going to produce something that's amazing because the genetics first and foremost were not good enough to be amazing to begin with so okay. genetics are probably the very first thing that a grower should think of mm, right there genetics right on right on thank you for that andrew and up next we've got ben you can introduce yourself and oh yeah a little bit about your perspective with uh, environmentals and seed genetics yeah hi everyone i'm ben from sticky finger seeds and uh, into the mic. I'm, uh, I'm born out in New Zealand and I've been on Maori for two years now and I've uh, been working with Will for a year and um, you know New Zealand has a very different climate um, to what we're working with here and uh, then moving up country to 3200 feet and working with the clouds right and both really high humidity but we're dry so it's um, you know the plant really expresses different things but the beauty about it is we have really fertile soil being up there on Haleakala and you know, we're lucky that we can actually plant in the ground with the runner and you know, just a companion plant and do all of that. You know, it's just really not many people have that in their backyard that they can work and have a relationship with the plant. And um, yeah, can you so, get closer to the mic? Oh, yes, yeah. and uh, yeah, um, but uh, no genetics, it all goes back to that. We're all working from you know, certain strains that came from certain gene pools and certain geographical areas, and you know, working with them and breeding them and um, sort of you know just uh, working with the plant and that's pretty much uh, what I have to say. Cool. Thanks for that, Ben. Um, and I see Kale. Aloha Kale, if you could um, unmute and introduce yourself. Our, you know, best suit for your environment. I would uh, go in that direction. Um, just knowing what seeds you're buying and what they're capable of. Um, I don't just blindly buy seeds. I make sure that like there's something beneficial that I could use. Yeah, many to that. Thank you, Clay. <laughs> We've also got um, up next is Aaron. Aaron, if you want to introduce yourself and yell into the microphone so know. everyone can hear. Hey, how's it going, guys? Thanks for all coming together. This is pretty fun to be able to talk about such things that are close to my heart with all these like-minded individuals. Um, I run a company called McKenna Genetics. I also have a page called McKenna Medicinals. You've probably seen some of my outdoor flower on Instagram. Um, really, my focus is on art, artism, cultivars, and I think that all kind of ties into what everyone's saying here, and I don't want to be too repetitive, but Clearly environment and genetics are the most important factors. If you have the proper genetics, someone who does not know what they're doing will end up with a product that is reasonable. Um, but of course, keeping your environment clean, getting your genetics from trusted sources, testing and running all your genetics. Um, the difference between 100 feet in elevation is gonna show slightly different uh, features in every plant. So. There is a lot of variety, even in one cultivar. Depends where you take it. You could see in California, and it would display different characteristics than it does here in South Maui or any other location you might be. So there is a lot of variety, even in one cultivar. But um, dialing in your environment is probably the most important thing. All right. Thanks for those answers. That's through number one so far. and. So next one is kind of a softball pitch. 
what we're looking for. Um, and this is, we're gonna ask Ben first, if you wanna come up, Ben. Ben's here with us in South Maui Gardens. And Ben is going to tackle the question of number one piece of advice for new growers in Hawaii. Well, I think the biggest thing you can teach people about growing and the advice is a lot of people don't know about light supplementation here, right? To keep the plant in a vegetative state for 18 hours with a little clamp light at night to keep that plant in a vegetative state. And as soon as you take those lights away and you sort of put that plant on a um, sort of what is a 12 to 13 hour cycle here in Hawaii, you know, a lot of people don't know that. And they're like, oh, I put my plant outside and it just flowered. And it was, was it an auto flower? I'm like, no, it was probably a regular seed, but you just put it outside now, right? So that would be my biggest thing, pH and good quality soil. And that's, that's probably it. All right, that's fantastic. And um, for those of you that, that didn't catch what we're doing here, we're putting all the names back into a hat and drawing names uh, for the who answers the next question. So up next uh, is Kalei. Your name came up next. Kalei, if you could take a shot at your number one piece of advice that you would give um, new growers in Hawaii. What I would do is, um, first of all, stay humble. Um, realize that you're gonna make mistakes. Don't be afraid to ask people. Um, the cannabis community is a beautiful community and everybody's willing to help um, give the shirts off their backs. So start slow, start humble and you know, prepare yourself to fail and pick yourself back up and ask for help. Um, there's always someone out there that's willing to help you. Um, everybody started from the same spot. So just keep that in mind. Um, don't get down on yourself. What I'm trying to say is when uh, you run into a hiccup, document everything make sure that you can fall back on your mistakes and then you can kind of correct them as such all right that's fantastic i love that advice <laughs> very cool that was Kalei. Whoa. up next we've right. got will uh will the question uh to you is what's your number one piece of advice for new growers in hawaii um, everything Kalei just said, you do, you hit it in the nail head, bro. You know, starting with being humble. <laughs> you know, like I said, I got my ass kicked when I, I came here and, and um, it's a wonderful learning experience. I, I'm so connected with gardening right now. So my advice, um, pick your genetics really carefully, you know, maybe try to work with someone from the community first that has a local genetic that's been, you know, used to the pathogens and so forth here. Um, always share, once you find a great genetic, always share it with the community, because um, that's where you got yours more than likely. That's, that's, the, that's my advice for today. Fantastic, good advice, good advice, thank you, Will. And Loretta is up next. Loretta, what's the number one piece of advice you would share um, with new growers in Hawaii? Just learn, learn everything you can, reach out into the community because we are here. Um, you know, ask the questions, like Kale said, you know, learn about your strains, learn about what works for you. Um, you know, we don't just sit around to get high anymore. It's medicine. We want to know what it does. And people need to know what that medicine does. Here, what I do, I'm the head medicine tender here as far as being on the line with the patients. And I'm here every patient day and everybody's got a different problem. I suggest you stay humble and learn about the people, the patients that come to you and, and, and give them the right info, show them the way, because we don't wanna go standing on the street corner no more to buy weed. It's medicine nowadays, it's legal. We have a right to it. We have a right to help each other. That's what I do every day. I humble myself and I do the work. And um, all the blessings come when all the patients are happy and smiling. It's not about me anymore. It's about them. Every time I walk through that gate, I put it behind me. Whatever it is I'm going to and know that today is a learning day. Simple as that. 
Right on, Loretta. That's great advice. Every day is a learning day, and we have learned a lot today. <laughs> so thank you. Up next, we got Aaron. Aaron, what's your number one piece of advice uh, for new growers in Hawaii? There's a lot of new growers coming on the scene, and I think it's important, as everyone's already stated, to remain humble. This is an environment I think we can all thrive in, and I think really that separatist mentality that that won't work. We need to collaborate. We need to stand strong together and transparency above all. So as you're saying, the patients, they're really what's important, the medicinal qualities, being transparent about what genetics are at play and what the benefits are. I think hybridizing and utilizing different CBDs, um, not just THC, but all the cannabinoids. And um, the information is probably the most other most important thing. Um, people really need to understand what these benefits are and why it would it be applicable for them or someone that they love. And um, I've personally seen it help a lot of people, a lot of different ailments. And if people don't know about that stuff, how are they really gonna be able to get on board and how are we gonna be able to keep the momentum that we have? So we need to stay strong and we gotta to stand together. Yeah, yes, I believe on that one right there, bro. Yeah, many to that. Uh, Thanks, Aaron. Uh, up next, we've got Andrew. Andrew, what's your number one piece of advice for new growers in Hawaii? Okay, so the staying humble part, as everyone else said, I totally agree with that. That's always important. Um, but as far as growing, I think keep it simple, especially if you're a new grower. Don't try to go all in and, you know, buy every bottle on the shelf in the store or try to overthink or overdo it. Just try to keep it simple chat with the, whatever grow shop you're going to, just chat with the employees there, have them recommend something simple. Um, you know, you want to, obviously you want to learn a little bit about pH and a few things, but you don't have to know everything right off the bat and that's okay. You can still end up with a pretty good product and then learn from any mistakes there and apply it in the future going forward. And you can always expand and perfect your craft, but, in the beginning, I think it's just everybody has really high expectations. I think lower expectations. Be uh, just ready to face some challenges and just try to keep it simple so that you hopefully don't overdo or underdo something. Um, the other thing that I think most people run into when they first start growing is overwatering. You tend to think that maybe it needs water every day and maybe in a really dry environment and in a small container it may need water every day but especially here in Hawaii most most people especially young clone or seedling if we're talking a new grower in the beginning over watering I think is most people's challenge they have to get over and so I like to do the knuckle test just stick my finger down in and you know if at the second knuckle if it's dry all the way up top but if the second knuckle I feel moisture then I'm using it to hold off unless I know they're not going to make it through the day and you know if I have to leave or something then you know you got to do what you got to do but just because the top's dry doesn't mean that the rest of it's dry and uh, so many problems stem from overwatering that uh, I think that's you know really important for new growers uh, so I think that's the most important things that I can think of right on well hang hang tight Andrew um, because we just drew your name again so you're first up for the next question. And the next question is just, can you describe for us uh, what your major right. soil components are? You know, I'm real simple in the soil department. Um, I'm, I'm actually a uh, pro mix. So it's just peat and perlite and mycorrhizae. So real simple. I like it because it drains well, it dries out really fast. Uh, since I'm in the deep jungle, I need it to to drain well and dry out fast because even if it doesn't rain, it tends to stay pretty wet. So um, I think it's great for starting seeds. I also think it's great for uh, finishing around out. But uh, as long as you're feeding liquid nutrients, if you're uh, if you're gonna be doing like a, a you know mixing amendments into the soil. I'd probably recommend like a Roots Organic or other organic potting blend. Uh, but as far as me personally, real simple, pro mix. Um, and I, I think that's also a great starter for any new grower because even if it's a little more forgiving if you do overwater, 
Um, and so, yeah, ProMix. Thanks for that, Andrew. Up next, we got the Grow Guru in order. What are the major components you like in your soil? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, got to unmute. No there problem, buddy. Um, I like to, like how Andrew is saying, um, keep it really simple. Uh, one third, one third, one third, usually your base, which is your cocoa peat. Um, then I want to do another third of like a casting or a compost. This is me personally. And then another third of aeration based on where your environment's at. Uh, then from there, you kind of build home for the microbes using like a biochar, um, whatever else you want to a la carte in there to, to customize your grow. I uh, highly suggest that you do research and whatever amendments you're going to throw in uh, after that one third, one third, one third base mix. So after you do your base mix, whatever you want to throw in based on your environment, your strains, or however your experience is, you can kind of take it from there. Right on. Great advice. Um, up next, uh, we got Aaron. Well, Aaron, you're up next for the question. Um, what are your major uh, soil components? Hey, guys. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of different schools to thought on soil, and I think Honestly, there's no right answer except for that there is a lot of different paths to the top of the mountain. So I think for being growing, um, there's nothing wrong with starting with organic soil that comes from a bag. I've always had good success with root, Roots Organic Soils. Um, I, I personally like 707, um, has minimal nutrients in it. You can control your own thing. That's a great place to start for, as I said, beginners. Along the line further, you might find yourself wanting to get away from using any bottled nutrients, and um, that might promote thought of getting into living soil, of remediating your soil, reusing your own soil. These are all great concepts, and it kind of just depends on when your environment, as we discussed, but what your setup is. Um, it could be outdoor, it could be indoor, um, but I think that's a great place to start. That's where I started, um, going to your local grow shop, supporting local asking the questions with these guys. Um, they're all really friendly guys and girls and they know what soil might be right for your climate, your elevation, your moisture content. So I would say ask questions, but um, stay organic. And um, this is medicine, we have to do it ethically, so. Right on, thanks for that, Aaron. Um, and Loretta, you're up next. From here and there. So, um, because where I'm at is always wet. So I always want to make sure that I got some of that cocoa in there to keep it, you know, a little dry. I got that pro light in there, you know, some, uh, pro mix with that mycorrhizae really, really good for me up where I'm at because I'm in a really wet area. So I noticed that really works for me alongside with some oyster shell and some gypsum. Now I used to get really tired. Um, with um, turning soil. So I went ahead and brought me a cement mixer and I realized that some of my plants was burning here and there and everything in there and I turn it on for two hours and it just mixes everything in there. The gypsum, you know, I go to that neutral light place out there in Kenya, everyone goes there. You know, um, the oyster shell, you know, the blood meal. Um, and um, I have a, uh, a worm bin and um, with soil in that. And I always make sure that I'm mixing everything evenly. You know, um, it depends on what pots I'm using, um, what plants I'm growing. Depends on what strains I'm working with. Cause right now I'm working with some 15 footers and they're requiring big pots with a lot of soil. So not every um, strain that I'm growing is, um, is the same as the next. Um, but all those nutrients in there, um, you know, really works for me right where I'm at. Thanks for that, Loretta. Up next, um, yeah, I really appreciate your manal on that. And up next, we got Will, Deep Green Genetics. What are your favorite soil components? Um, I'm trying to get as close to living soil as possible, but it, it seems that we're still at like a 50% input every time. So there's a couple, it's soil hunting here, as they call it in Hawaii, when it comes to input, it's difficult because Department of Ag holds us back from the better soils in the market, which are microbial rich bacteria, you know, there's a bacterial community. 
in the soils that you get. You know, even some of the bigger brands like Soil King have some really good soils, and they don't use perlite. So I try to stay away from you know, soils with that. But we have sourced here at a couple of the places the EB Stone product, and um, it's a California soil, so that's the primary input. And then in the last few years, maybe up to five years, I've really sort of been practicing less is more with nutrients. Doing a lot of vermiculture teas, of course. Um, but other than that, really, it's as simple as I'm using nutri-rich chicken, organic chicken pellets for a lot of the veg stage. Amending the soils with that, um, even in the beginning of flower, I use that in sort of, you know, really no liquids or anything like that. And then kelp, of course. Um, I'm forgetting something. Oh, Calmag, of course. Duh, yeah, you know, Calmag. That's the liquid that we use. Calmag, yep, yep. Yeah. And, you know, really, that's um, the, sim the simplicity of it. Less is more in a lot of ways when it comes to farming. Farming the soil is everything, as we all know. Um, but getting really good, rich soil here in Hawaii is difficult because the Department of Ag is very restrictive. On certain so we mix them. Gotta mix them up. Yeah, for real. But I really liked what you were talking about, how you made your soil. Yeah, it's not easy because it requires evenly mixed everything. Right. And then sitting it and then covering it, making sure that, you know, everything cooks on the top, sort of, mm -hmm. you know, it's got to steam up and it's got to do its thing. You know, um, it's got to go through its process, you know. Um, yeah. Right on. Okay. Shoot. Thanks, Will. Um, hey, Aaron, you're up. And we're starting a new round of questions. And we're just gonna we're gonna keep this one to uh, 20, 30 seconds for the round. And let us know if you grow indoors, outdoors, a combination, and what you like about that environment that, that you grow in. So I mean. Personally, I like to use the sun, so I flower outside and uh, I utilize a gift that we have here of being able to do so year round. But I have to say it kind of depends on your operation. Um, vegging, it's important to have a strong environment where you can control your climate and your temperature. So depending on what kind of system you want to have, if you're running with clones, if you're running from seeds, you're going to want to utilize a combination of the two and um, and bounce back and forth to make everything strong and to utilize vitamin D. Right on, right on. Next up, we got the grow guru. And the question is, you know, let us know if you grow indoors, outdoors, combination, and what you like about the way. Um, I grow both. I think um, indoor is more of a predictable, perpetual system. Outdoors, you'll run with some variables with like uh, pests, mold, um, even some light pollution at times. Uh, but if you want to do a combination, I think it's important to have a perpetual system and utilize a combination to um, get your perpetual, perpetual system going. Um, that way you can predict every harvest that's coming, um, when to propagate, when to defoliate, you know, when to amend your, your beds and everything else. So exactly. I like to utilize the both. Right on, right on. I like that answer. And uh, up next, Will, um, the question is whether you grow indoor, outdoor combination and what you like about the way that you do it. Um, I'm really happy to say I have the luxury of growing under the sun 100% now. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I, you know, quite a few years ago back in the Northeast, I did grow indoor and other indoor grows, but you saw a lot of it. Um, I've learned since that I think medicinally, uh, you definitely, it's just the laws of nature, you're definitely going to get a fuller profile and a lot more uh, cannabinoids and whatever deliveries there is in the plant, for sure. Um, so I've mostly, um, I mean, today I, I'm with some company of people that grow some incredible indoor too. So mixing the two is quite nice, right? For chirp point flavors and different profiles. But um, yeah, uh, sun grown, and I think the industry really should steer that way, the technology right now um, with mixed light and so forth to grow utilizing mostly the sun is incredible. Um, so right. yeah, that's where it should head. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Loretta, how, how do you feel? Um, 
Well, I grow outdoors because I can't afford the electric bill for one. You know, I, have, I don't own Hawaiian electric, honey. So I, I, I got to deal with the sun. But I do have an outdoor greenhouse and I've got it. I've got, um, it's pretty high. Um, it's over 15 feet right now. Um, but um, I think it's a 20 by 20 by 30 that I'm working with right now. And um, all I can do is the outdoor. And I just got to battle the environment. And I just got to make sure that that um, plants are being fed the right way. And um, they're being sprayed if I got to spray them. And they're being shucked when I got to shuck them because I, I deal with a lot of PM issues. And uh, right now, I ain't got no PM on my plants. Um, and it's just an everyday thing, you know. Um, what am I using for spray? Uh, everything in the Ed Rosenthal, what he taught me, you know. Um, it depends depends on what time of the year I'm growing. If I'm growing in the winter, oh boy. I, I, I don't want to grow in the winter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally, totally understand that. And, and just, yeah. you know, it seems like just using a greenhouse, you know, is uh, sort of this in-between ground, right? It's not really the full local environment if we've got a greenhouse, but it's not indoor either, so. Seems like this middle. Yeah. Um, Andrew, um, indoor, outdoor combination. What, what's your style? What, what do you like about it? Well, you know, I'm I'm completely off grid. So I, I, even if I wanted to grow indoors, it's just not a viable option. But yeah. I love the sun. Uh, the sun grows the best medicine, in my personal opinion. Um, and I believe science backs that for the most part, showing higher terpene content and things of that nature so I do think for it to be the, the the best medicine it can possibly be it needs to be grown uh, at least in part with the sun um, so yeah I, I grow with the sun I think as far as quality goes a mixed light in a greenhouse um, probably grows the nicest looking stuff that I've ever grown or seen so um, that's my opinion on what's the the best but I personally just use the sun and then, then just supplemental LED lights to keep them in veg, you know, no way around that, unless you want tiny plants. And veg them out, there you go. Yeah. Ooh. Right on, right on. So, um, you know, uh, concerning these environments, indoor, outdoor, then we've got, um, you know, this movement for tour based um, Appalachians and um, areas, microclimates, uh, uh, different connections. Yeah, these are different connections um, to the land and the, the specific environment, right? Um, and, and so, you know, some people say this is like uh, Chardonnay, you have to have a certain percentage of Chardonnay grapes and a bottle of Chardonnay wine uh, to call it Chardonnay wine. So, um, I guess the question is, do you see value in local Appalachians um, playing a role in your growing operation? Like, will you be moving your plants into the ground to try and develop, you know, that these type of environmental relationships or, or is this even a, is, is this even an issue? So that's the, I think that's the question. And uh, Aaron, you, you drew the first card so you're up all righty well um yeah chardonnay obviously comes from a certain region and it has special characteristics based on the environmental pressures at play we are really lucky here in hawaii we have amazingly amazing conditions for growing outdoor everyone else in the world i mean except for similar climates and the same longitude i'm sure you could look across the map at mexico and find a great area similar to here but um it's a very special place the soil, the air, it's different and um, it creates a really unique cultivar. So we spoke about the environmental pressures. I think um, this is something that could be utilized to marketing as to quality. And I think it's absolutely applicable. Um, and it speaks to the special qualities uh, that make Hawaii's cannabis the best in the world. Uh, amen to that. Um, thanks, Aaron. Uh, Ben, we're, you know, we're looking for some your thoughts on Appalachians and the importance of 
No, totally. I mean, Aaron, Aaron spoke beautifully there and uh, um, something that I've been researching recently are Appalachians and particular land race strains that are coming out of um, India in particular, you know, and strains that are grown up at 8,000 feet in the Himalayans. And, you know, these are 12 to 15 week long flowering strains that can get up to 20 feet. You know, these things are amazing. And um, so bringing some of those Appalachian type strains here to Hawaii upcountry in the cooler climes, I think thrive, you know, so that, that made a huge importance to me and the fact of why I bought those seats from that company, you know, and uh, so that was something that I took into account and, you know, and I'm lucky to grow on the ground. You know, I start in pots, I start in veg and start them under lights and sort of supplement with night lights and then put them into the ground to flower. It's pretty much how I do it um, and try and do a lot of compost and, uh, you know, bubble stone um, for 24 hours with microbes and just try and feed the soil as much as you possibly can, <laughs> you know, with kelp and, you know. Try to keep it indigenous kelp, mm -hmm. indigenous kelp microbes. Yeah, and just thousands and thousands of red wiggle worms. They're our best friends, I think. <laughs> Super nice, super nice. Thank you for that. And Loretta, you, you got the next. Yeah, man, you know, um, <laughs> I, I hear you on that one because, you know, everybody wants to have these Hawaii strains. I went to Louisiana a few years back and they have this open bar and we could smoke some weed. So I brought some weed from Hawaii over here to over there. And I shut that bar down because everybody was like, what the hell was that? <laughs> so, you know, um, this is where it's at right now, this is the I see it every every day I come here, every day I'm on patient day, every day I, I'm, I'm away from my house to come and find the peace here and finding the strains along the way, you know, hey, Jay, check this out or Jay will go, oh, shit, check this out or I'll be like, oh, fuck, what the hell, you know, all these Kauai electric, these, I know a lady right now on the mainland and the base line of her kennels is these old Hawaiian strains. So yeah, you know, we, we're right there, bro. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that. Thanks for your manao. And we got some more coming in from Will. Will, um, we're talking about Appalachians yeah. and how they might affect your grow operation or not uh, in the future. And um, I think in the future, Appalachian has, Appalachian has a great value um, for what we're doing with cannabis. It's, it's in California where the corporate's pushing the small farmers out because of the way the legislation is. Um, there's groups and guilds and so forth that are taking, you know, very seriously to the state to get Appalachian recognized for cannabis. This will be the only protection that the small farmer will see. So that will apply here. But what's fascinating here is, of course, we have all these climate. And we've talked about this before, how even like two, 300 feet of elevation change in certain areas here, at least on Maui, make a huge difference. Um, so growing in the soil in Appalachian and terroir in particular is a difficult one because as a lot of us know, anything below 1500 feet here in Maui is most likely got arsenic and contamination that's still off-gassing, but you know, it's, it's crazy. Um, so most of the, like we talked about our soils before, most of us aren't growing in Hawaiian soil. We're growing in, in Canadian peat moss and, and California, right? right. And, right? Yeah, so there's I'm nothing. Hawaiian soil, baby. Yeah, so there's nothing terroir about, you know, that input at least or Appalachian in a lot of ways, the air and the sun are the closest we can come. So it's, just, it's tricky, but in when we have an industry here and in certain green zones, like even where we grow our very few vegetables and stuff here in Maui, that's the green zone, 2,000 to 4,000 feet. That's right. gonna, where the terroir is gonna happen in the Appalachian. Shit, you're not, bro. Yeah, Roger that. Thank you for that, Mano. Oh, well, and, uh, Clay's name came up next. <laughs> hey, brother, man. Um, but yeah, I think with like microclimates, it's a thing. Um, just like how any any genetics will call for um, their own specific microclimates, <laughs> but we're we didn't talk about the indigenous organisms in those microclimates. Um, the ability to photosynthesize food and keep that soil food web uh, intact, while that plant would be thrive because the plant is the basic uh, maestro in the orchestra when it comes on to the, the rhizosphere and all the microbes around it. So 
basically finding a strain that goes best with your local mycorrhizae uh, would be the best benefit for, uh, I guess, getting the best result out of your product in that specific geographical location. Exactly. Yeah, right right on on money, brother, man. For sure, for sure. And we just uh, got Andrew left. Uh, Andrew, you want to take a shot at well, um, I know, Andrew, you have a lot of knowledge in this area. So, you know, answer however you want, man. Thank you. Uh, well, I, you know, it's hard to compare it to wine, but in a lot of ways it, it is, especially looking like 10, 20 years down the line. And, uh, you know, I think Hawaii could be known around the world as like the Napa Valley. The climate, microclimate that can be found on earth uh, right here on our islands, especially the big island itself. Um, and appellations, I think, are very important for protecting small farmers going forward. They're a way for a brand recognition. Uh, let's just say 10, 20 years from now, federal legalization has already taken place. Hawaii small farmers and large alike are allowed to export Hawaii-grown cannabis to shops to the United States, um, which there'll be a very high demand for once the time comes. Uh, but, you know, having the appellations, a uh, way to differentiate your garden's product from the next garden's product. And like many others said, you know, it can just be a couple hundred feet up the mountain that it makes such a huge difference. Um, I gave my friend a bunch of cuts. I won't mention his name, but he's somebody a lot of you guys know. Uh, and he ran some things uh, um, about an hour north of us here. And they came out totally different than I've ever seen them here at my spot down 50 foot elevation. Um, so I think uh, appellations would be great. And I think a decent place to start with that would be to take the different districts of the island and then have a Makai district and uh, or a Mackay section of that district and a Malka section, um, possibly break it down further. You could make it real complicated if you wanted to, because we do have so many different microclimates. But a, a somewhat simple way would be to just, you know, differentiate the districts that it's grown in, and then also Malka, Mackay, uh, things of that nature. Definitely important conversation to be had and. You know, the local Hawaiians definitely should be involved in that more than anything because they know the land more than we do. And, um, you know, I think you'd have to make an exception for cannabis with the whole soil thing here in Hawaii because, yep, yep, yep. like Will mentioned, a lot of us do not use the native soil. In fact, in Puna, it's, you know, there's not a lot of native soil to be yep. found. So, um, you know, we, we do need a way to describe the different effects that our local environment plays on our garden and especially if we're going to be marketing this cannabis to other people across Hawaii or if it's yeah. being sent to the mainland for shops. Um, either way it would be great for everyone and it would just fetch a higher price. It would make it more marketable as a, a product. And that's that's yeah. all the knowledge I can share on that today at least. Right on. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and Chris, I see you're, you're nodding your head. Would you like to contribute any thoughts? Um, I... <laughs> yeah, I mean, Andrew said it so well, right? And this is something that we've definitely experienced. I mean, where we grow, it's in Waimea, we're on the dry side, we're at 2,600 feet. And um, even people just down the road on the wet side uh, experience totally different climate, right? They have different moisture issues, different kinds of bug pressures. Um, and so we definitely experience those microclimates. And at a macro level, yeah, I, I definitely think that there's something uh, of value there, right? To, to protect. It's, um, you know, I, I think some parts of the United States are sort of like, they're, they're, um, sort of positioning themselves as bulk commodity growers, right? And you can imagine grows in like Missouri or Iowa, and it's just like hectares and hectares of cannabis. And there's like big columbiners and they're running them through mass extraction systems. And 
you know, they produce what I call like gas station CBD, right? CBD isolate that's like cheaper than water. And I don't see Hawaii being a place like that. Like I don't see Hawaii just doing like generic cannabinoids that are grown in a commodity style. I think that Andrew, you nailed it, that there's something um, kind of special about Hawaii, not just the climate, but the microbial life, the quality of the sun. I know we run into this all the time uh, when we're not just looking at PAR, but we're looking at UV indexing. And even, you know, states that have really high UV like Florida or, you know, places in Southern California, their highest UV days are still not Hawaii high UV days. And I think that's why, you know, tourists will come here and they'll think like they have an idea of how much time they could spend in the sun. And then they'll get like the most wicked sunburner their whole life. And it's like, yeah, that's UV 10. Like that's freaking crazy. And, uh, you know, anecdotally, I think one of the ways that we experience that from a cannabis perspective is that, uh, you know, people will try to grow CBD and it'll be a strain of CBD plants that have done really well on the mainland who never grow hot. And then they'll bring them to Hawaii and they'll go hot every time. And it's because probably there's something connected to a lot of UV being in the light and the plant basically pushing out more THC as a protective mechanism. Um, so there's definitely something special going on. And I love your idea about Malcolm Mackay or, you know, looking at different elevations, but there's, there's something to the Appalachians or something to the provinces. And I don't know if it's like looking at it from the perspective of bioregions or if it's looking at it from the perspective of like old Ahupua on maps or if it's looking at kind of environmental regions that have already been mapped out. But, um, but there's something there and, and it's definitely worth kind of as a community across the entire state, the whole island chain, just kind of like mapping out the places and identifying what's special there. So um, yeah, yeah, awesome conversation. I just like, everybody's input was so good. I like really love listening to everyone's comments. Yes, sir, yeah, that was perfect. Yeah. Thanks for that, Chris. Much, much gratitude for your mana'o. Um, then we'll, um, we'll get a little bit, uh, more granular now with uh, your recommendations for pest management um anything that you do like companion planting how do you what do you have for a ipm um strategy and andrew um it just so happens you got picked again after going last pretty cool um cool I I'm going to start off by actually touching up on what Chris just said. Uh, I'm glad he said something about the UV index because that is a major role in why our cannabis puts out the trichome coverage that it does. And uh, it's also why it will wreck a lot of unsuspecting mainland growers who are familiar with good Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Uh, uh, premium angle of the sun for cannabis growth um, here across the islands. Um, as far as IPM, since I don't want to take up too much of this question with the previous one, um, I like to use ladybugs. I like to use praying mantis. I also oh. spray pure crop one, uh, plant therapy, and um, what's the other one? big time exterminator, which are all friendly products. And uh, I discontinue spraying anything the last three weeks of flower. Um, just not that those products cannot be sprayed later. I just prefer not to spray anything the last three weeks. Um, the other thing that can help with like say caterpillars I've found is the, um, it's called sticky trap. And it's just basically some gooey bug catching goop that you put on your base of your stem. It can help a lot. Um, you can put a screen around your greenhouse if you're in a greenhouse. That'll help keep a lot of the moss and um, caterpillars out. Um, other than that, you know, I think that's all I can touch on with IPM. Right on, right on. Yeah, thanks. That's super helpful. Aaron drew the next card. Can you? describe your IPM recommendations? Um, so I agree. I mean, honestly, I'll keep it simple. It's 
important to pH your water and to make sure your plants are in a clean environment. But um, I personally like to use plant therapy. I agree, I don't like to, it's not ideal to ever spray a, a plant late into its flowering term. Um, so, you know, staying on top of these things in the earlier stages are gonna help prevent issues later, but plant therapy seems to do the trick for me. You could also use um, Dr. Zymes or um, Green Cleaner. There's lots of different brands, but keep it organic and just make sure that you have a good regimen um, is more important than anything. So twice a week, you make sure you're, you're getting your RPM in, you're defoliating every 21 days, you know, find a good schedule for you and your schedule with life. But these are things we have to do all the time to prevent bigger issues. So stay on top of it, plant therapy. Right on. Thanks, Aaron. Loretta, what's your Monao on integrated pest management? All right, thank you. Sandy, okay. You want to answer? Yep, I'll, I'll answer. You know, I got to tell you, man, I've tried it all, bruh. Yeah, I get in, in my bag, I carry on book tonight on these separate little, these, these techniques. And I tried Dr. Zion's, but I didn't like the Dr. Zion's because in some way it was maturing, prematurely maturing my plants. And I didn't, didn't stick to the Dr. Zion's. And then, you know, I was using a milk regimen and a sesame oil regimen, but then everybody's like, oh, don't do that. You're going, you know, the stomatas, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's just pretty much what works for you. And right now, what works for me is making sure that my soil is on point. Because as long as my soil is on point, the bugs gonna stay away. And caterpillars drop all the time. So I got one, everything covered. And I just make sure no moths, no little, them, those guys get inside, you know what I mean? And, um, yeah. you know, um, do what I can. Right on, right on. Cool. Well, yeah, I, I, I want to look into moth traps more because um, I have been using BT um, and it's tricky because I won't use it, you know, at least a month um, before harvest. You got to stop, right? And yeah, sometimes, yeah, yeah. They, sometimes they sneak up in the last couple days, you know what, you know, it's just like there they are. And um, I haven't yeah. found a way around it, you know, besides spraying two weeks before harvest, which is you know, just the less is more, right? That's yeah. what I like. So um, other than that, there's a Athena project, uh, um, a pro uh, product that um, I think is just a different oil. And I think we mentioned the uh, Dr. Zymes. Uh, again, less is more, but you know, some aphids um, hit the veggies a little while ago. And so um, one thing I bought, um, I got a Petra sprayer, which really is a game changer. One of those right, right. electric you know, blasters. And it's really good for just a really good saturation, but still there's a lot of need for the, the hand um, spraying too. You know, like with BT, you really want to soak the plant. Um, and a few cycles ago, I did um, think I had russet mites. So I'd sprayed micronized sulfur and it worked like a charm. And I noticed that um, some of the strains that would get a little bit of this rust towards the end of the, um, they sort of, the plants must have systemic it because they didn't. Those are really the three things, BT, sometimes sulfur and veg. And then of course, if you have soft body insects and so forth, you got to spray one of the you know, citric acids, either the Zymes or the Newsom. There you go, bro. Driving me off the walls with that Dr. Zymes. Yeah. <laughs> no, for real though, man. I sprayed Dr. Zymes. Next, you know, my plants, all my hair is all red. Wait, what? Oh, wow. I've never run into that. Yikes. Yeah, so you know, I gotta make sure that paintbrush, because I'm a paintbrusher, or I, I get huh. my hat, I like directly spray my buds. I gotta up spray, <laughs> yeah. side spray like that. Because I okay. look at it, I'm like, whoa, bro. But you know, depends, depends on, um, depends on the environment, depends on where I live in a microclimate area. So okay. five minutes it's gonna rain, storming cats and dogs. Yeah. And then five minutes it's gonna be, no, clear as bright as day. And then 10 minutes after that, when everything's all dried up and everything's good again, it's storming again. And my plants are going, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. 
Well, that makes for the best breeding, though, right? You know, tort, you know, putting them through all that, they're putting out that in, in their DNA to say, "Whoa, whoa, yeah. next generation, we're gonna be more ready for this." You know, I make, I, I know how to make lacto too, um, from right from our 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 head farmer on this farm right here. Mm -hmm. uh, Lua showed me how to make my own lactos. Right on, right on. Well, thank you guys up next. Uh, Grow Guru, what's your thoughts on the IPM? Yeah, um, I found one product that worked super good, um, Marone Bio. Uh, it's Regalia, Grandivo, and Venerate. <clears throat> Basically, it's all bioinsecticide, so it's using um, like a predatory system, uh, biocontrol. So it's not really, it, nothing is harmful. There's no topicals. I know the Regalia were, were, would work systemically into the plant. But um, yeah, using that three in combination pretty much takes care of everything without having to worry about any residue or any byproduct that I'm going to be uh, ingesting later on. Uh, I try not to go. I try not to go past week two in spring anything anyway. So pretty much I'm kind of like if if it's bad, it was my negligence. I got you. I, I feel the same way too. If yeah. it got messed up because I messed it all up. <laughs> yeah yeah so we're, we're gonna yeah. shift gears again and uh gonna talk about a little bit about a combination of things so i'm gonna combine a couple of the questions uh because we've got so many questions to get through um one question is how do we call in our friends you know other people other growers into more organic growing techniques and um, is there a relationship between that and our best Hawaiian genetics? And, and then we'll get into some current limits of possession. And um, so the question is, um, and, and this could just be your thoughts on organic growing um, and, uh, you know, its applicability to medicine or, or whatnot. And, uh, who you consider to be taught on top of uh, local Hawaiian genetics. Um, it's a chance to do some shout outs. Uh, and uh, going up first is Mr. Andrew. Um, you could unmute your mic. Good luck, man. All right. I'm sorry, one more time. What was, the, we're going over the, you said uh, at the end that we're gonna go over who we respect as uh, breeders here in Hawaii, but what was the first part one more time? Uh -huh. Yeah. We, it was uh, cutting out on me. I'm sorry, what what can we do to call in uh, more local growers, maybe new growers into using uh, organic, maybe even natural farming techniques, um, just getting people started, you know, focusing on the soil and, and whatnot from the very beginning, right? Uh, instead of them having to learn it the hard way over a multi-year process. <laughs> yeah, I think you know organic is is a is definitely my preferred method. Um, so I think most people prefer to grow organic. Um, some people maybe find this a little harder because it it can be if you make it. But um, you know, I think organic gardening is. For the most part, at least in Hawaii, suggested more so than it may be in other states, um, at least by like say local grow shop employees and whatnot. The people here care about the land more than they do in some other places. And so, um, you know, I think a big part of it is a lot of new growers come into grow shops and ask what, what the people working there suggest. So I think a lot could be said for what those guys uh, are capable of doing by what they suggest. They have a lot of uh, say so in what new growers especially end up uh, going with. I will say that I'm not totally opposed to chemical far, uh, growing because some strains just really don't respond well to organic approach. Um, like some of the older sour diesels and chem dogs, um, the finicky strains, the ones that can get a deficiency pretty easy. Um, a lot of times the plants can respond to a chemical fertilizer to correct the deficiency 
faster than they would say an organic one. So um, for like my sour diesel and some of my old chem dog cuts, I do use a little bit of chem ferts just to uh, boost them, keep them at optimum health. So uh, I know this is an organic approach topic, but I did want to hijack and say that I do think it's okay to use chemicals within reason and, you know, not large scale on the hillside that's going to be polluting water rays, but for a backyard grow or indoor grow, um, you know, it's, I think it's okay at times to use that too. Just try to keep it minimal. Right on. Any shout outs for your favorite uh, local breeders? Man, there's actually so many. Um, I don't really want to start naming names because I'm sure I'll forget <laughs> somebody and uh, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But there, there's a lot, really. And there's a lot of new and upcoming ones that are doing some good things, it looks like. So, uh, you know, just support who feels right, you know, um, as far as breeders go and suggestions for people when they're buying, buy seeds from people that can show you pictures of the flowers that they're uh, trying to tell you seeds of. It can also provide you a description of what to expect, um, flowering times, maybe humidity resistance, just things that tells you that this person grew those seeds because unfortunately in today's market, greed has overcome cannabis seeing like a lot of other scenes. And so there's just a lot of seed makers making seeds and selling seeds, but they're not actually testing them and putting in the work. And so I think it's anybody who's out there making seeds, testing them before they sell them, I can respect. And, and there's a lot of talented uh, seed makers, breeders across Hawaii. Right on, that's for sure. Um, no doubt about that. <laughs> And uh, we got uh, Aaron up next. Um, so yeah, Aaron, kind of a combination. Uh, how do we call in more local growers for uh, organic growing? And uh, any shout outs to local uh, favorite breeders? You know, I mean, I think kind of as Andrew said, um, it's okay to not grow fully organic. And I think there's applications for certain times and certain places where strains might not re re um, respond appropriately. And otherwise, I think that um, it'd be nice to see more farmers markets or more competitions, more the, the ability to share the medicine that we're growing organically. That's really what's going to help people, you know, get on board with growing organically is they got to try and they got to see that it's better, it tastes better, it feels better. And, um, you know, if you feel it, you know it. So the more that, the more access we can bring to coming together, like I said, I envision some kind of farmer's market situation where the local grower has incentives that are put in place to provide local organic goods and you gotta support local. So I think um, that's where that's at. Otherwise, um, shout outs, I mean, it's tough. There is a million and a half guys doing seeds nowadays, but in all reality, I've had good luck with Hawaiian Heirloom Genetics. They come out of Maui. Matchmaker Genetics, always fire. And 808 Genetics, you know, he seems to be doing his thing on Kauai. And um, those guys all, res all respect. But there's a million and a half guys and girls doing their thing. So as long as we can share, collaborate, come together like this, you know, just, you know, I think that's what's most important. Uh, thanks for that, Aaron. Really appreciate that, Marilla. That was great. And with that, um, I think we've got just enough time maybe um, to give uh, thanks. And at this time, I'd like to ask everyone to unmute their microphones and uh, give us a one word uh, shout out and gratitude and uh, maybe something that resonates with you and Medical Cannabis Day or Medical Cannabis in general. Um, you can also type it into the chat. Um, hey, Brent. Hey, hey Maggie. Uh, Cole, I didn't get to answer. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, we we didn't get to ever, we didn't get to Will okay. uh, Loretta either. I apologize, but I'm good, brother. We we have three minutes to give. I do, I do have a quick shout out though, a really quick shout out because I've been here with Jason at Karawailua for five years, bruh. And I have watched our head girl tackle these strains for these patients 
And I can name you each strain right now that patients come back for and we keep, because it's so amazing, bro. The ghost strain haze, the sky dweller, our, our virgin perps, our purple wreck, all those strains that's been worked on right here. That's where my shout out is tonight because I've grown it all and I still ain't got it right. But I know one thing, I watch one person here on this farm alongside the owner of this farm, the two owners, I watch them work these ghost trains. I watch them work these max pineapples, these, these tangents. I watch it all, bro. I I've tasted it all, bro. I'd That's actually like to shout out is tonight. Yeah, and I'd like to, I'd like to back up my sis low here, honestly. Yeah, bro. I, I stay pretty quiet. I'm a legacy farmer. I'm a female farmer owned five right acres. Here, bro. I stay pretty quiet. That's why I let my sister talk for me this time, but I'm, I'm not going to be quiet when it comes to a shout out. I, uh, I tease Jason that he's my Kevin Jodry of Hawaii, and I, I mean it. He's like, uh, he's the one to follow. And Wailua Care is like so grateful for their open arms and their education and their support. And just, you know, I just, I couldn't be more grateful. Smoking some of that wedding cake tonight <laughs> from the farm. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> I'm gonna start off. <laughs> Are you gonna... Okay, Roger. Um, honestly, shout out to everyone that's sticking out their necks for the movement, um, giving selflessness for everybody, you know, giving all the resources, all their uh, information, everything. Thanks for, you know, guys like Jay, shout out to him, uh, putting his neck out here, Lawrence. being a frontiersman, Lawrence, everybody. You know, all everybody, even down to you, Sister Lowe. You know, Andrew putting out the best genetics out there. Shout out to Andrew, man. Love you guys. <laughs> yeah, mahalo, Andrew. Mahalo to everyone for putting this on. There was a lot of work to put this together. We appreciate you guys big time. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Feel free to unmute. Hey, hey man. When you guys up there, are you up there? When you're on Oahu, y'all better come out here to Kewailua, bruh. Guaranteed. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday, but you can come on those other days too. Just hook it up with Jay, bruh. <laughs> on any other days, bruh. Jay got you, bruh. Just come on down, bruh. <laughs> Taste all those strains we'll be talking about tonight, bruh. Kale, Kale was in our farm years ago. You know what I'm saying, bruh? <laughs> <laughs> But this is where it's at for all of us right here tonight, bro. Uh, thank you, guys. Kerwai Lua Farms, Anahola Market, right, yeah. please. Thank South you, Valley Gardens, thanks for your venues. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Uh, right here, special bro. thanks to thank Chris so and Hawaiian Ethos. Thanks, everybody, Hawaiian Ethos team. Uh, thanks for doing a great job making great medicine and for covering our basic costs. Thanks for sponsoring the event. Uh, yeah, much gratitude. Hey, uh, thanks for having us and those to put in this Thank you, everyone involved. <laughs> yeah, and Maggie, Maggie, do we do we have a list? I mean, there's a, probably a long list of. Oh yeah. <laughs> Hold on. I should say thanks to Ans for uh, doing our T-shirt printing. Um, thanks to Chris for some epic design work. Um, yeah, totally Chris. unexpected and, yes. and people are, are awesome. Yeah. Uh, uh, Melee Cannabis Clinic in May. Thanks to woo, Alternative Pain Management Clinic. Uh, thanks to Aho Marketplace. Thanks to the Complementary and Alternative Medicine of Oahu and James and Theo. Uh, thanks yes. for Aloha Organic and Daniel Anthony. Thanks for Lex Talk Hemp and OZ Knight. Thanks to Andrew at Matchmaker Genetics. Thank you for Kahua Seeds for donating a bunch of seeds. Thank you for Oahu Kush for donating a bunch of seeds Hakua. and everybody else. Hakua Kush. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie. Yeah. Thank Special you, thanks, Aaron. Aaron. Thank you for... Mahalo, everyone. Thanks, Maggie. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Maggie. Yeah. Thanks for doing an amazing job. <laughs> thank you. Shout out to Dr. Cliff Otto for making all this happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Without 
how Dr. Otto can, wouldn't be recognized. Be as so thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Otto. Yeah, mahalo uh, Marufa, it's nice to meet you at the night market the other night. Thank you, thank you James. Thanks for helping out with the organization of the events and offering up additional venues. That was super, super great. Yeah. Yeah, thanks Jason. <laughs> uh, thanks Jason. I'm, I'm leaving the meeting because my venue is closing around me. So aloha, thank you everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank everybody. It's a dream, so believe it. Now get ready to receive it. Let's take back America. Let's take back America. What is? We have to take back our country, piece by piece Full time now the peace will have to increase A mediocre leadership that we love to seize And get back our name overseas If you don't have a plan to succeed You have a plan to fail Don't care how much man, them throw in a jail Babylon the judgment, unsigned and sealed